welcome, welcome, everybody. Uh, hello, I, I am Daza Greenwood, and uh, I'm joined by Brian Wilson and Megan Ma of the um, law.mit.edu um, research uh, initiative, and specifically the MIT Computational Law Report, uh, which is putting on this year's seventh annual MIT Computational Law Workshop. And uh, we're going to get right into it today. We've got a really packed agenda. Um, and and I'm, I'm going to hand it off to Jim Rogers. At, oh, can we advance the slide? Uh, I'm going to hand it off immediately to our first speakers, Jim Rogers and Danny Blood, who, who are going to discuss our case study on a business, legal, and technical integrated system. So with that, um, hopefully my audio is okay and you can hear me, and, uh, and I'd, I'd like to hand it off to you now. Great, if we can just advance to the next slide. Brian, are you running the slides? Oh yeah, is that going? Oh, okay. Um... While you're doing that, I'll do some intros. So uh, yes, I'm Jim Rogers. Uh, I actually work at the Hartford Insurance Company out of Hartford, Connecticut, soon to be underneath a lot of snow. And uh, I lead our agency automation at the Hartford. So we're about a 200 plus year old company. We're in the financial services industry. We provide uh, property casualty and group benefits uh, products to agents uh, across the United States. And I'm joined today uh, with Danny Blood and I'll let Danny introduce himself. Thanks, Jim. My name, as Jim said, is Danny Blood. I work for a company called Boston Software. Boston Software is a small independent software vendor. We provide software for the insurance industry. Um, primarily, our software is used by independent insurance agents that represent companies in the property and casualty realm. Well, great. So today, um... Danny and I just wanted to join. We're both on the board of um, ID Federation. We wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, what problem our industry had or has. And uh, we want to share with you our story and what we've gone through with a with a lens on how we work, uh, we, we, we uh, tackled that problem. And Danny's going to like start us off with give you a little frame for what our, our challenge was or is. Sure. Um... The insurance industry um, is probably notoriously known as being slow moving, at least in a technological perspective, um, maybe some other perspectives too. But when we talk about the internet age in, in the insurance industry, things started rapidly moving, you know, circa, you know, 2000 with the advent of web services in particular. And so what happens is, in, insurance companies are starting to open up their platforms to allow independent agents um, that they that represent them to be able to get into those systems. So it may be a little step back in the context, independent insurance agencies are agents that represent multiple insurance carriers. So an independent agent is the kind of agent um, that you walk into and they may be able to give you a quote for four or five different companies. Um, for your auto or your home as a consumer. And this is the realm sort of in which we work in. Now, with the explosion of these web services um, and the ability for um, insurance carriers to provide their offerings online, there also was the vendor space, which is where I work in, where we provide software for the independent insurance agents. Our software allows the agent to enter the consumer information um, for, let's say, uh, auto policy. You enter the information in once, and it's got connectivity to the RMV for the registry of motor vehicles lookups and stuff like that. They enter all that data once, and then they can click a rate button that gets rates for maybe 10 different companies. Because an independent agent, small shops might represent three, but bigger insurance agencies that have multiple locations might represent 10, 20 different insurance carriers. So our software is sort of, if you think about Orbitz, how you can go into Orbitz and put in your flight you want, you get all these different you know, availability and, and price points. Our software works in a, in, a, in a similar sort of way. 
So vendors like Boston Software um, have services that can connect directly to the carriers. So now if you're an independent insurance agency and you're representing 10, 20 carriers yeah. and each one of those carriers has their own set of credentials to get into their system, that presents a challenge. If you're an insurance carrier like the Hartford and you have thousands of agencies and each of those users has their own set of credentials, you can see how the scope of credential management really sort of gets, gets huge. Now, in the industry in general, as these web services became, sort of became widely adopted, more used, and people were doing more connectivity, you know, people started saying, wait a minute, how are we going to secure all this stuff? Right. And there are, you know, famous stories, uh, you know, and we have a slide that shows it in the insurance industry of the people that work the front lines at an insurance agency, what we refer to as the customer service representatives, the CSRs might have 10 sticky notes literally right on their monitor with the username and password for each system that they need to log into. Um, now, clearly, this is not a tenable solution for the long term for us from a security perspective. And if you're the owner of the agency, this is obviously re represents a security risk for you. And then just the management of all those passwords, you know, it just becomes completely arduous. And it's still a problem now. I mean, it's still a problem that we're, we're trying. This is the main problem we're trying to solve. How do we handle one particular identity? One person has an identity to get you into all these spaces so that you can remove all that friction, all the management of different passwords, different identities, and be able to do the work that you really need to do, which is the, the business of insurance. Um, that's sort of the backdrop, the problem that we were facing as an industry and what the problem that we tried to tackle. That's great. So uh, I'll help out with this one. So. Danny framed that really well. Um, we want to eliminate or significantly reduce the amount of passwords we have in our industry. It's plain and simple. It's our mission statement. So what do we do about that? Like, so a bunch of us got together in the insurance industry, specifically in financial services, and we decide there has to be a better way to do this. There has to be a better way that we can create a framework on which parties can work together and um, figure out how we can just have users have one ID and get to multiple carriers. There gotta be a way. And so what we did is we created what you now we now know as sign on once. It's really uh, based on rules that we created uh, by creating three entities within sign on once. We have a business group a technical group and a legal group. And we formed those and we had the great fortune to at that inflection point many years ago, meet Daza and actually uh, helped us a little bit with that uh, structure. And um, we use those today and it was developed by those three disciplines. I would say the three legs are all equally responsible for creating structured agreements that we created um, for the organization. Um, we have technical certification process. We've developed rules. We'll talk a little bit about how we, we do that. The business really drives it. They drive, you know, what are we trying to accomplish? How are we going to get our messaging out? Um, you know, what's going on? The technical committee, they're um, working on, you know, more of, of what the standards are, where we're headed, and where we're going. And then what did, what did we do? Um, to address sort of liability, indemnification. Those were very big concerns um, that we had. And how are we going to deal with those if there was a loss or there was a breach or something were to happen? And what we decided to do was we couldn't, we, we were branded ID Federation. Like if you can go out to idfederation.org, but our users, our agents would have no idea what that means. So our business committee decided to come up with sign on once with like a little like a little hand, and that's what you got to do. And we created um, an organization that's just passionate about getting rid of passwords. And today, as Danny described, you know, on the far left are all the sticky notes. Like that's being generous, three. We're talking like 40, 50. 
So when you have an agency that has 20, 30 employees and they each have 40 passwords, they, some organizations are big enough where there's just one person that tries to manage all the passwords. It's really crazy. We actually streamlined it and implemented a process where an individual can log into their platform, be authenticated, and then that platform's logging them into uh, parties that are affiliated with this framework in a seamless way that's much more secure and um, we don't have to worry about so much passwords. I'll let Danny, uh, you want to pick up this one? Sure. Um, I, mean, I, I talked to gonna... a little bit, but yeah. Yeah, what I was going to add was that, you know, when we're talking about sort of the, the parties involved are the independent insurance agencies and those users, yeah. there's the insurance carriers, and then there's also the vendors. And how do you get all of those groups of people, those three different groups of people, each with their, their own needs, uh, requirements, um, into a, a working relationship in a way that everyone feels like their needs are met and satisfied and that we can move forward. And that was sort of where ID Federation as an organization was born from, that how can we put something together? Why DAZA was involved? How, how, what kind of structures work to make this kind of thing happen? Yeah. And that was where the brainchild of it all came. We have to put together something that can work for all the needs of all the interested parties, but still solve the main solution. And the goal of it is that we are working together. This is this part of the thing that we all share, security, for example, identity management. We don't want that to be a differentiator on a, you know, we want that to be something we all work together to solve that problem. So ID Federation sign wants it's a nonprofit, right? We um, were organized in that way. Um, it's I mentioned the partnership of the different people that were that are involved. And as Jim said, we have it's sort of a set of the three different legs, the technical, the business, and the legal. Getting it off the ground, though, you know, as Jim will tell, if you uh -huh. want to hear some stories about trying to get all those legal arrangements, you know, we've got insurance uh -huh. companies, large, like the Hartford, for example, is a very large insurance company. You can imagine uh, the attorneys on Jim's team, <laughs> the requirements that they might want versus my software company is a very right. small company. We have less than 30 employees total, right? different needs, different requirements on that set, and trying to get all those people together. The legal piece was a big part of it as we were trying to get it all, all set it up. Um, but we needed to get all those sorts of pieces as, 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 as buy-in. Um, yeah, I would say too, Danny, on that front, like our board, it was interesting how we structured the nonprofit and the board. To Danny's point, we had Fortune 100 companies <laughs> and we had to the size of Danny's. Danny may be a small company, but has very big market share, say in the Northeast with his product, right? But, you know, the Hartford would want indemnification like unlimited. Danny's like, well, that would put me out of business. Um, so the legal teams, when we first got together, had the hardest job um, to really look at all the different organizations and what we did. But when we formed the board, we created, and some of the other nonprofits in our industry or standards organizations, sometimes they're, they're, um, they're not all inclusive. Can all their members be on the board? Maybe only certain types of members can and others can't. We didn't want to have that. We wanted an all-inclusive everybody in. So we have about a third of our memberships are insurance carriers, a third are software providers like Danny, and some are independent agents, and they all have equal weight. So the Hartford can't trump Danny's vote. Danny can't trump my vote. You know what I mean? So we, we keep the board so that all the constituents are represented regardless of their size or status. Um, we actually wanted representation from the three um, in, our, in our industry. Uh, we have, for sign on months, we have business, technical, and legal, but also in our industry, we have carriers, independent agents, and software providers also. And so I think, you know, Danny brought up a great point on, 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 the, on the legal side of that. Yeah, I mean, the last, uh, if we go back just for a second, the last bullet there sort of gets into what Jim was saying, that solidarity. You can, I think, easily see from the other bullet points, like the value add that an organization like 
like ID Federation sign at once could provide to the industry, just based on the description of the, and we've all experienced this, right? The explosion of passwords and identity and management. Now you're a small business owner, and like Jim said, an independent insurance agent, you have 20, 30 users and they have, and you're representing 10 companies. It just, it becomes a really, you know, really difficult situation. You can see the value add, but you get to that last bullet point. We needed that, that community solidarity. One point we're all moving and working to the same group. And that's why we, you really needed an organization yep. and a nonprofit independent organization that's fully represented by all the interested parties, um, but that we could come together in solidarity to create a solution. So the trust framework, um, we created what we call a trust framework. You guys can actually see it out on our, on our uh, website. I think Daza posted it in, in, the, in the chat, um, but it defines the governing rules and participating in ID Federation. Um, it's reliance, is, it's, it's based on commercial relationship. Most of our partners work with each other already. So they have underpinning legal arrangements already. ID Federation kind of sits on top of that. I mean, if they don't have any, they can live within the framework and its indemnity rules and, and how we handle security. But if they have existing ones, it kind of builds on top of that. Um, we want to improve the identity and password management in federated ways between uh, the parties. The framework applies to parties um, who have executed it. So you have to join ID Federation. Um, we do have some costs to cover our costs to run the organization, but as more people join, we just lower the fees because we don't want to make any money. And there is some limited liability protection between all the participants um, that join. So that trust framework is really the essence of what um, ID Federation has. We don't, you know, just to be clear, we, we're the transactions between an independent agent and a carrier do not go through are you know physically don't flow through any software that we have, or they're yeah. not going through a hub. I mean, Danny, maybe you can explain that a little bit more. But yeah, I mean, it, it's so. it's a really good point that I was going to add on to, which is that the trust framework itself isn't software. Um, it's not a right. product. What it is, it's it's a sort of like a bubble, a legal uh, an agreement bubble that the people that are involved in the trust framework, um, like the you know. If, the old jokes about the circle of trust. Well, in the trust framework, you have to be in that circle of trust to be a participant, right? You have to pass the certifications, which we'll get into if you're an identity provider. Um, you have to be a member to participate, those kinds of things. But the trust framework with the three legs of the, the legal pieces of it, the business agreements and in the technical sort of specification and requirements provides the bubble or you know, the, the arena in which the trust framework operates. It's not a specific product. It is not a specific piece of software. What it is, it's a set of agreements. So on our next slide, um, we encourage um, those the constituents to join. So how we do that, we um, work within the industry. We attend industry events, conferences, um, we're, we're constantly looking to grow um, our organization. And a lot of that has to do with uh, software vendors like Danny, uh, working with carriers like myself and actually you know, connecting up that technology and following the guidelines and the trust framework rules that we've agreed to for security. Um, let's go to the next one. And so, Danny, I'll let you handle maybe security certificates. Like maybe you can talk to them about identity providers versus relying parties and sure. you know, how we handle or how we, how, how do we, how do we trust? <laughs> how do we build trust that the identity provider is, I don't know, trustworthy. It's, you know, or, you know, certified. Right. Well, so um, we, we <laughs> Based on the group, we may have made a little bit of a leap on everyone understanding what federated. Oh, that's identity, true. Yeah. Federated yeah. identity is. Yeah, yeah. You know, federated identity is um, the idea that um, someone knows who you are, and instead of everyone along the chain of communication having to um, re-ask you your challenge questions via your credentials or whatever, that if they have a trust relationship that they will be able to trust that this particular person is who my software says to Jim. So if I right. am 
federating the identity, then Jim will trust that that person is that person because they fall within the trust framework or our software, fall, our, our organization falls in the trust framework. And he believes that that identity is the identity that I say that it is because I've done things to verify that identity. So we talk about, um, you know, getting into the trust relationship. Um, there, there, I was trying to find this, there was a quote that Daza had, I can't remember exactly what it is, but the idea is that you like, the trust is verified, you know what I mean? It is like, there's a set of security standards and we have what those security standards are, they're defined and someone has to be certified to be able to be an identity provider. So the identity provider is the person or the organization providing the identity. They then are giving the identity, federating it out to other people that they can connect with so that the, the, the user, the end user doesn't have to sign in to all those systems over and over again. So the entity, identity provider is the place where the certification needs to build from, right? They're the ones who are verifying that I am really Danny Blood and Jim is really Jim Rogers. And that once I communicate with someone else and I tell you that this is Danny Blood or this is Jim Rogers, that you believe that. So the, the, the security piece of it um, on that side is really about a set of standards, uh, security standards. We have, like, there's a, we'll get into some of the specifics yeah, a little we'll bit later it. on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there, it's all about having a, a, you know, a very concrete security posture that meets a set of definitions and standards that we've come up that are based on best practices. I mean, we're not trying to manage that per se. I mean, we're using other industry standards and whatever to sort of define that. But the idea is, is that there is a security posture. It's been verified. And like I said, the trust is not given. The trust is actually verified if you're a identity provider. Um, we have various requirements that are built in. Um, we go back one, sorry, just a second. Um, you know, based on user ID and password requirements, um, there's stuff there about the management of IDs and passwords, et cetera. Um, the types of certificates that can be used because we talk about the implement, if we get into implementation details, that's like a SAML security token that's being passed around and how can you verify that? Um, uh, various ideas, how we manage, how organization manages their certificates and logging and monitoring is important because you need to make sure that if you're an identity provider, you need to know when there was a failure as well as a success because you can go back and trace and have audit logs of that information so that you can see, are we having attack situations? Are there someone trying to spoof identities? That sort of stuff. Um, and, and it, you know, it just goes on and on from there. There's, as you can imagine, there's a whole series of things that need to be sort of validated um, for someone to sort of be verified and enter that trust framework as an identity provider. So uh, this one, you want to take it then or you want me? Um, I mean, I'll, I'll, I can do this one. You can do it, all right, great. Quickly, since we were just talking about this, the same idea. Yeah. Um, the certification process, like I said, it's required for an identity provider. So if you're on the other side, what we call the relying party, the relying party is someone who's relying on an identity provider. So in the real world example of an independent insurance agent using our my software, Boston Software's product that's known as single point rating, single point rating, if we're the identity provider and we wanna get a quote from the Hartford and send that information, be able to connect to their systems, then Hartford then becomes the relying party. They're relying on the identity that we provided, right? So the certification process is that, like I said, the, the, the risk flows downhill. Like I, I, have to, I have to be in charge of all that risk if I'm the identity provider. Um, so that's where we have to have the certification at the identity provider side. Relying parties don't necessarily have to be certified. Um, they have to sign the participation agreements, which has a set of its own sort of standards, but it's like, we're not verifying their systems per se. Um, the third party, uh, this the certification assessment is done by third parties. Um, we, we have a couple of different ways in which it can be done. The certification options um, are listed there. Um, smaller organizations or industry organizations often will choose a third one, which is uh, one that uh, through a third party assessment where there's a set of standards. We've partnered with a company again that helps us um, not like we're not in the business of, of identifying and managing 
like the best security practices. So we work with a, a, a company that provides that, a consulting company that sort of helps us through that, helps us define and build those questions. And then we sort of farm that out to them for the certification process because it's gotta be third party. Um, I think that sort of gives the general overview of what we do. But oh, the final point there is that the, the board of directors sort of, oh, the, the Jim and I are both on the board of directors for ID Fed. Um, it's our job, it's one of our, one of our duties to ensure we're overseeing and reviewing the trust framework, any changes, the results of certifications, and we have the final set of approval to grant certification to an identity provider. I think we covered some of these, Danny. I would just add the, you know, Danny, the other thing too is that certification is an ongoing process. So if there's material changes to their to their uh, models, then they go re they re go through if where the identity management is created and managed, if they're moving that from one cloud to another or there's material changes into their structure, they have to go through certification again. And no matter what, even if it's the same every every um, uh, three years, they have to go through certification automatically. So it's a, it's a constant. Uh, test, make sure, verify, because everybody's trusting those those identity providers. Um, so if you guys have questions, just put them in the chat. I'm going to cover a few more things. One thing I did want to mention before I get into future enhancements was one part of our structure when I was thinking about this early on when we started was um, the structure we have. And we really had the business, technical, legal, and we had a harmonization like box. And the role of that person or individual was to harmonize the work going between the committees. So that, you know, the law department would say one thing, the technical people would say you can't do it that way, and the business people would change the process. <laughs> so the harmonization um, box we had, person actually in there came from the industry, and he had a background of almost like an arbitrator. And he helped us like in all the organizations, like he knew where we wanted to go because the board would set the direction, but he would help. And he had, he was like an arbitrator and he happened to have a law degree. So he could, and he was involved in technology. So we found the ideal and he was trusted by the entire insurance industry. So I'm like, oh, we, we picked him, we recruited him. We said, you're in that box. You, there is no way we can get everybody to agree on all this stuff. And he kind of put us in rooms. He would help us like think through what the main obstacles or gaps or issues were and ways to like work as a team to work through those. Now we don't use that role so much now. We've been mature for many years and we don't actually use the law side of it much because we have everything's pretty much uh, going you know, fairly well. We bring a law team in as we need it. But most of the work right now is on the business and technical committees. So when we look at like where we're headed and where we're going, one is just, you know, we're gonna um, considering adding more to the um, provisioning and deprovisioning users. Um, so we, we wanna adopt, our biggest thing is adoption. We wanna eliminate passwords. It's our same mission, missions never changed. I know mission statements sometimes change as companies uh, grow. Bars never changes. It's always the same motto. And um, we want to eliminate passwords. We are looking at um, how identity gets deprovisioned. So once an identity provider removes somebody in their system, we want a way for them to just tell the Hartford or tell all the other carriers that this person no longer is employed by this agency. Now, since they don't know their IDs to get into our systems, I mean, if they leave the agency, they can't just like log into our system because they, they wouldn't know how to log in because they were federated. But we still have that identity in our system. So, you know, what we're looking at ways is to make sure our identity is like cleaned up. Like a lot of times we, if we don't see somebody log in for a long time, we'll just automatically purge their credentials. 
but we thought it's better if our, our, our identity providers could have a way to tell us. Now, you know, our nonprofit is not gonna create those technical standards, but the technical committee is gonna look at what our existing proven standards that would allow that business function. And could we incorporate those standards into our framework? So um, that's one thing where we're looking at. And then also in the future, how to provision new users. So right now, if I have an agent, they wanna do business with the Hartford, they actually create an identity in our system first. And then when they try to do a transaction from their agency with their identity provider to us, it syncs up. We see the identity, we have keys that we match on, certificates, like everything, we're good to go. But we would like a way to have the agent or the person say, hey, I, want, I do business with the Hartford and just you know, walk them through a process where it just automatically provisions on our side. So there, you, and there's probably a lot of people on the call who know much more about the technology and standards um, than I do, but those are what our technical committee is doing. And technical committee, you know, it's interesting the types of people that we have on those committees, because some are more into the development side of it. Some are more the chief security officers at our companies. Um, so it really depends on what the topics are, um, you know, who, who from a technical point of view that we're bringing into those committees, um, you know, so they morph on the business side. Um, I would say we've had people from uh, carriers that are providing their marketing people. We have people um, from agencies and software providers that are like more product visionary. Um, you know, this is how um, having a streamlined workflow can work with sign on once in products. And so from the business, there's some different people with different expertise, but you put it all together and they're pretty powerful, each committee sort of on its own. But um, those are some of the things and where we're headed with our users. Um, some of the, you can see on, um, I don't think we have a slide with the users, do we, Danny? Like, I'm trying to think. I don't think so. Well, just yeah. to jump in for a sec, Jim, to, yeah. to give everybody a little bit more context on the committees. The committees, we talk about those, you know, the three legs of the trust framework. Right. We have a committee for each of those. Right. And as Jim said, most of the work right now is happening on the business and technical side. But those committees are made up of volunteers from the members of the organization. Oh, right. So right. The, the, the board of directors is made up of member people oh, that are members, right? Nominated it's, from their, yeah. No, nominated from their company. So, you know, Jim and I have been nominated to be board members um, from our companies, representing our companies. But from our organizations, we have people that work in the committees and, and do some of that work. So the technical committee, you can imagine, like Jim said, you have CISOs and deputy CISOs or people that are involved in that kind of stuff, as well as developers helping right. um, formalize some of that stuff and review some of the, the technical pieces. And on the business side, as Jim said, it's again, they're volunteers from member members of the of, of ID Federation itself. So that was our logo. That was our model. That was kind of a brief, uh, we went through that pretty fast, Danny, but that was at least an essence of our story that we wanted to share with you today. And, you know, Daza and uh, Brian, if there's folks that have questions or they want to send some in, or if your group has any, uh, I think Danny and I are more than uh, glad to answer some questions that you may have or that we didn't cover. There's a long history here. It's a very interesting uh, way we've kind of, uh, it, it's very interesting. It was great to see all the constituents like Danny opened up with. We want to compete on product, customer service, claims paying ability, price. But we all agreed we're not going to compete on security. We don't want any of our members or anybody in our financial services to be in the news. Um, so, you know, it's been great from that point of view and to see our members uh, have that spirit and to work together has been has been great. You're here. Um, hey, hi, can you all? Uh, is my audio okay now? Yes. Yes. Uh, 
I'm so glad. Apologies for the um for the um I blame Comcast for every evil thing that happened at the beginning. Um and uh but having said that, um just um I just want to applaud you both for that presentation. Um this is the first time I think that there's been um outside of the insurance industry, like a coherent like um explanation of this really important federation and this important model. And I'm just completely tickled and pleased that MIT is able to provide the forum for this. Uh, and I, I think there's a lot of latent learning in what, what you just said. And what you said is so dense. Um, like we could pick almost yeah. any single thing you said and go an entire semester on this. Um, but what just a couple of things I wanna highlight uh, by way of maybe catalyzing questions and comments. Uh, well, we'll start with Jim Hazard. Hi, Jim, um, who says, um, thanks for the links in the participation agreement, to the participation agreement. Everybody, is it okay if I add to the group uh, data sharing, uh, to the group of data sharing solutions? So one thing I wanna say is one of the great um, best practices of ID Federation um, that, that's brought you the um, sign on once um, service here is that they had the courage to actually make their system rules, the, the, um, the trust framework and the agreements public and they're published on the site. Um, yep. So uh, Jim kindly mentioned that I've been involved in uh, the sort of helping put this together in the beginning. I've put together many of these types of federations and, you know, um, uh, di different types of consortia, but no one else has been willing to actually share the rules so that it can be understood and reused to some extent. And the same goes with the participation agreement. It's right on the site and it's, um, I mean, uh, go ahead and um, it's, it's your just to say, but I believe it's completely um, yeah. uh, public and reusable for other industries that may be interested, right? That's why I have it publicly available on the website. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Dynamite. Thank you so much for that. And then the, the other, one of the other just before we get into the details, deep learnings that, that was uh, embedded in the last thing that you said, Jim, is that we're not competing on security. We're not competing on passwords. Like we do compete like uh, providers yeah. like you and Liberty Mutual and Progressive right. compete on selling insurance. The vendors compete on customers. The brokers compete, you know, for, for, for um, end users and policyholders. And so the, I would say this is a great example of what is sometimes in the like the Sloan School of Management or business schools, they call co-opetition, um, where there's competition at the business level on products and services. Um, but at the same time, it behooves everybody to cooperate on certain types of things. And in this case, a network to allow a common set of functions, in this case for single sign-on, um, without having to have 100 passwords, is, is, is perfect. And, uh, and I just want everybody who's struggling with this in all so many different areas in your lives and in your businesses to take to heart the um, clarion call that, that Jim said, which I think is what made it possible for the whole industry to get together on this and for it to have survived and, and been stable uh, for so many years, which is that uh, our mission hasn't changed. They have one clear beacon, like lighthouse mission of we're gonna kill passwords and there's a lot of adjacent security things and business functions and wouldn't it be nice if we could have these other services and there's right. a lot of other stuff you could do but in order to pull off something that's complex at the business level with competition different relationships and commercial pressures the legal level it's somewhat you know complicated with like who's liable when someone relies on someone else to log in and security openings the technical level there's some complexity there you need to have a clear business objective that you can measure and that the law and the technology can support and reflect and achieve. Um, and so I just think there's a ton of leadership by example here that I hope everybody can, can take as learning from this, which is get the business part right first, write it down like in use cases and have the legal and the technical part support and reflect it and then be real careful before you budge at all from like just doing one thing right takes a ton of work the more you start scoping and creeping the mission um the much harder it gets and so i mean it, if that's not super clear i just want to highlight that it's like embedded latent wisdom within what we just had shared and uh and, and it, don't take it for granted okay now then um so now let's now with those things uh, uh 
um, at a high level. I want to um, encourage anybody that has questions to bring them forward. And we've got our first one already from a alumni from the MIT Media Lab and uh, actually a college friend of mine. We went to Clark University together back in the, uh, the 80s. Um, and it's uh, Brendan Marr who asked, who says, I have questions on SSH and DIDs. Okay, um, so could we promote uh, Brendan to, um, to let him unmic, please? Uh, yeah. Or let him unmute, rather? Just one moment. Great. Uh, and so for those that may not be familiar, DID is a shorthand for like the new, new shizzle in identity, which is um, decentralized identifiers. Um, and it's basically um, like when you have a, if you're doing something on a blockchain nowadays, uh, you'd have a wallet, which generates a key pair. Um, and um, there's a protocol that the W3C World Wide Web Consortium has um, uh, published a, to a few years, not many years ago, that def defines how that can be the base of an identifier that you can use for, um, for lots of other purposes. Mostly it's digital signatures, but you can, and I've seen integrations that let you do login with it as well. So at the bottom of the stack, um, the kind of um, credential is, is the private key in like a blockchain wallet. Um, I'm, I'm not doing it justice, but that's, that's the nature of it. And um, I might further say, by the way, that uh, part of the reason for bringing this case study forward is uh, to give an example of, uh, of the things that it takes to get a whole industry um, with different players in the industry, the providers, the vendors, the, um, in, the, in this case, it's the uh, agents and the brokers. Like we have this whole constellation of people that have to do one technical thing kind of the same way. So when you're looking at very fresh new technologies like blockchain and um, decentralized systems, part of what we're trying to say here um, impliedly, but I'm gonna make it explicit is this is like your list of things that you wanna solve for. So just kind of saying it's secure or it's trustless um, okay, that's nice as a slogan, but like, go ahead and get a spreadsheet and take each of the items that Jim mentioned, or go through the system rules, the trust framework, and make sure that you've addressed each one to the right level of proof and, um, and reliability in the new way. So this is also a great cookbook of the types of issues that it takes at the business, legal, and technical level to solve for. So with that, uh, Brendan, um, are, you, uh, are you with us? I you be am, I can't get video. Oh, no problem. But we, we have your audio. Um, so oh, we have your, yeah, your sure. essence. And go ahead and ask your question. Essence or, or is wonderful. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you all can hear me clearly. Uh, I wanted to say, great going with the BLT, the business, uh, legal, oh. and technology. Uh, you know, that's one thing that I, I picked up from, from, from Daza, uh, how important, you know, all those pieces are. And it seems like you're really hitting it. Um, I did want to speak to and uh throw out some clarity and and uh post some uh, some questions uh the, the first is you know I, I find it all very interesting right because you know as i've come into the identity space uh it, you know it, it's it's clear that there's such a disconnect between how the computer industry manages and deals with keys in terms of thousands of uh, servers in a data center, you know, nobody's in a data center remembering passwords, right? It just doesn't work that way. <laughs> right. It just, it's not the way it's done, right? There's, there's SSH, right? You know, there, there's cryptographic keys for all those servers. Uh, you know, so we have, we have ways of, of, of doing this. The issues are regarding the mapping between the, the keys, the cryptographic keys and, and, you know, what is, you know, reasonably understood to have a meeting relative to, to people and organizations and teams. And, you know, this kind of gets towards, uh, you know, the, so the, the first question is, um, you know, have you, have you, uh, you know, thought up about the, you know, the way that the technology community deals with SSH. I kind of missed some of the details of your implementation, I'm sorry. Um, but the question here going towards the larger question is towards blockchain and decentralized identifiers because, uh, you know, blockchain at, a, at its core has signing of transactions, which are, yeah. which are cryptographic keys. And 
there are large bodies of entities that are uh, putting forth decentralized identity standards, including the Web3 and all the major players, and being able to map organizations, people, groups to keys is really the only path forward as I see it. Uh, please speak to that. I'm sorry, I'm a little long-winded here. No, no. Whew. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll jump in, Jim. They, yeah, they, yeah, I, I have a, a reaction to it, but you jump in, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say the, the way that I would start by couching it is that um, sort of in the way that Daza did. So we have yeah. right now a working sort of solution and then adding into that decentralization and, and blockchain is not something anybody on, I think is a, is opposed to right. uh, from a technological front. Now, um, there's probably concern on, on the insurance carrier side sure. of how these things would happen. But the way I would answer the question in terms of ID Federation is, is that we're constantly looking and exploring about how identity is going to move forward, how it's going to be managed. Because in the end, what we want to do is solve the problem for our industry in a, in a seamless way. And as Jim said, we're not there yet. We've been doing this for years and yeah. the industry is slow moving and um, we are still trying to get more adoption. So if that moved the needle on adoption, um, we would be looking at that because we're Correct. looking right now at things all about adoption. So in, in, in to backtrack and not exactly answer your question, but give you a little piece of context, one of the things that we are really looking at now and trying to figure out how it would fit into our system is um, third-party identity, identity providers. So if you're a larger insurance agency and you have multiple locations and you probably are using a third party to federate your identity already for single sign-on to different apps within your system. Examples are Azure Active Directory, Ping, Okta, et cetera, right? Some people may be familiar with those vendors, but those things don't fall within our trust framework because they're not a vendor that's in the insurance space. So we're trying to figure out how can we get greater adoption by utilizing some of those technologies. Now, again, if it comes down to everything moves towards decentralization and it just becomes a mapping issue, well, then we'll, then we'll pivot that way. But for right now, we're not really even exploring those kinds of things at the moment. Yeah, mine was just back to our mission. Um, and we have a ways to go on the adoption. And so our teams are focused on taking the framework that we have, that we trust, evolving it, but we're laser focused on getting this benefit out to our constituents and our independent agents across the country. But I'm, I'm with you, Danny. You know, we're constantly looking at new things. Um, we're always looking to learn like from this workshop and others uh, and bring those ideas back into the organization. But we definitely have a mission to spread the word because it's free to our agents. It doesn't cost anything and our vendors and our software providers don't charge for it at all either. So it's more of just an implementation and awareness uh, and the change management of it is, is what we're uh, working on now. Question for you, have you, um, have you looked into zero, zero knowledge proofs? Um, they might be useful at some point. That's that you don't have to expound upon that, but I just, I'm just great. throwing that out there. No, that's great. Um, just a, a thought on, the, just to follow up a little on uh, Brendan's um, suggestion, basically, to look at zero knowledge proofs. Yep. I agree that it, it could be useful for some of the business capabilities that are, you know, that oh, you're, great, that you're trying yeah. to solve for. And in particular, the thing I would look to, and I'll, I'll find it when uh, you're answering the next question and put it in the chat, yeah. but um, I was working with Ernst & Young uh, at the end of last year on some... Um, on some related matters. And uh, one of their projects is an application of zero knowledge proofs for um, ba basically the collection and distribution of, um, of, of, uh, of um, it's sort of like value added tax um, kind of things huh. uh, across jurisdictions so that you, you can, um, so, so that we've got a system that sort of deals more elegantly with the need to protect some information, but still have verifiable 
proof um, that, that some action has happened and the source of the action, that sort of thing. Um, and part of what's, in, so some of that's just the, techni the technology is very interesting. It's also yep. very interesting how they approached coming at a, their own kind of federation. In that case, it's mostly of government and businesses that have to comply and the systems have to work together. So there were, in some ways they were solving for even more complicated things with you know, sovereign nations. In other oh. ways, it's a much narrower question, but, um, but I'll, I'll find a link to that. They did an excellent white paper on it that breaks oh, down all great. the world. And actually the business, legal and technical each all have a pretty clear section. Uh, so oh. I'll, I'll do that um, now. So let's see, we have, um, okay, we've got some questions here. Um, oh, people are asking for that link. Um, computational privacy. Uh, uh, this is Mark Lazard, um, who, um, whose work I commend to you, by the way, uh, from another standards group, Paul Cantara. He's done great work in standardizing a way to provide basically um, like, like a log or like a receipt, he calls it, of consent. So when you've got a person shopping around for insurance or when they're filing a claim or something, at some point they're there's a lot of little consents, like I consent to these terms, I consent to sharing information, and a lot of consent management. Uh, and so he's done uh, great strides in how to sort of encapsulate that um, in, in a way that's um, more standard and, and you can kind of incorporate for into different systems for different purposes. Anyway, Mark's question is um, computational privacy, authorization standards like, um, oh, well, there it goes, like consent defaults, um, auth C. So, I think he's asking um, in somewhat generally, like where does the, so when I, when I think of SAML, uh, yep. the security that is being asserted in the security assertion um, kind of markup language is really um, authentication. Um, Correct. And so now I think he's starting to get into authorization. Correct. So how Correct. does that play into this? Like how, at what, I well, we haven't, but... we haven't, but we're starting to look at that right now. The technical committees are looking at the um, authorization side of it. It's a little scary from a carrier point of view. We like control. We like to control, once you get into our system, we like to control what you're authorized to see. Um, and, uh, but it's something that I know, Danny, we've had some discussions on that, and there's kind of different ways around it, too. Yeah, no, I don't know that we've landed anything. We hard haven't fast. landed anywhere at this yeah. point. It's a discussion point. Um, I'm not really knowledgeable about the, you know, the stuff that Mark is referring to. Um, I would have to uh, look into that a little bit more um, to see how. I mean, I understand that the idea that Daz is explaining, like there is the consent right. that people have to provide all the time, um, and, and 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 as vendors or companies that are you have to track it and log it, keep it. So um, I will take a look at that information. So thanks for the question, Mark. And I can offer a little context, um, putting on my, well, I don't have it, but like if I put on my like um, ID Federation hat from 10 years ago, um, <laughs> some of the con concept as I recall uh, from security was that um, there's, a, there's a kind of a clear architectural handoff for this system. So part of their narrow focus on fill a password is its password for authentication. Um, and then there's a hand. So when you log in, there's at the back end on the relying party end uh, that the AP brokers are logging into, you get access control lists, different yes. authorization kind of functions. So it's dealt with, but it's sort of like um, we authenticate the user to get into a system which then deals with authorization on Correct. the back end. That's how it works at every insurance carrier today. Yeah, that's exactly how it's implemented now. Yep. Yeah. The relying party, once the, the users once now, once you know who that, that person is, then the, the identity is mapped to the authorization that that identity has. So, yep. yeah. And then, you know, in theory, you know, I guess in the future, maybe if there's a business need for, you know, like um, some authorization that could be sent along in a tokenized way. That, that's guess. what we're thinking, Daza. Yeah, that's kind of where we're, we're, we're just like, how much do we do of that versus adoption of what we already have? You know what I mean? And, and of course, SAML, there's other ways to do things also that the technical teams are looking at. So we're just trying to balance that and our business committees, you know, working that out. Our technical committee needs to stay a little uh, forward in their thinking. So strategically, you know, we've got the roadmap and the plans that they're thinking of. The business committee's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We just need, you know, 
thirty percent more adoption. Those are our goals. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you know, we 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 just really want to see our customers, our agents, feel the relief, yeah. not be so worried at night about or the agency principals are signing paperwork attesting that they're a secure organization, they're following these rules. And when they don't know what people are doing with all these sticky notes, that's quite a problem, Daza, at least for these Indeed. agency principals to sign security agreements and they really don't know, you know, what's going on in their own shops. This helps a lot Indeed. and it allows those agency principals to execute on sales and growth and customer service and not have to worry so much about security. They can kind of have a better peace of mind. And we want that emotion and that feeling going out across independent agents. And when we see it, if you go to a conference and you, you start to see people raise their hand, applaud, like other people have no idea what's going on. So they're kind of, oh, why, why are you so happy? Oh, because I, you know, I work with the Hartford and I have a single sign on and, you know, we just need more of it. And that's kind of where we're headed. Yeah. Well, uh, MIT does not endorse products or services or companies, but it's certainly understandable at a high level to say, um, why am I happy? Because I work with Hartford and just <laughs> look and look at how great. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not trying to use do. that. We have we have it's, many it's, other it's, carriers on the thing, but um, it's just, I, just I, saying, I think the agents uh, are happy about it. Yeah, I know. So one, but one other thing that uh, that is worth saying, but as you were at the bottom of the hour, but oh, yeah. it's related to authorization, and it's um, yep. it's part of what sparked us um, getting in contact again, which is if yeah. everyone looks at the most current trust framework, which we we link to, it's at idfederation.org.com um, also um, under join us, I think, um, you'll see that the mo the newest amendment is to bring on board in addition to SAML. Oh, um, open ID connect, which Correct. is the, which is a, um, an iteration of OAuth 2, OAuth 2, um, a really great, um, modern standard that, that encapsulates, um, identity and related credentials, um, in a modern web facing way. And so, you know, congratulations to the ID Federation and sign on once for really c continuing to adapt and evolve in, in ways that, um, that keep pace with the, with the technical and business environment. Uh, so having said that, I want to thank you so much uh, for, for taking time out of the middle of your work days to come and share about this, um, this great example, Industry Federation, and, a, and, a, and I think a great, if I may say so, a great model of what we're talking about in law.mit.edu in the research and academic context of the need to, to take business, legal, and technical dimensions of a system and to be able to isolate them and then align them harmonize them and ultimately integrate them so that you can roll them out in, as part of a coherent kind of um, a singular system. So um, thanks very much for your time and for providing this, this awesome example. It was our pleasure. Thanks for inviting us uh, to talk, Daza. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having us be a part of it. It was really fun. Um, I yeah. hope some people learned a little bit of something or a little something about what it is that we do and, and how we're doing it. Um, I really appreciate you including us. You're here. Right. And I guess in closing, if you're at an uh, insurance agency or brokerage or insurance carrier or a vendor in the space and you are interested in getting in on this awesome action, it's the join us button right there <laughs> on um, ID Federation. All okay. right. Great. So with that, uh, we're going to move forward. Um, and uh, and I'd like now to, um, to introduce um, a, a colleague of mine. Um, uh, Killian Karen, who is the CEO um, and founder, I believe, uh, of, of Ethica. Um, and the reason I've asked, I've, I've, we've invited you to join is because um, in addition to your, um, your for-profit private business uh, that's in the, um, in the space of, uh, of, of, of privacy, um, you have recently, your company has recently released a open source platform that you've been working on for years uh, that, that, that I think and, and our team thinks is a really good example among other things of computational law. Um, and so I'm now going to change my hat from general computational law to reimagining law, um, which is, I think, exactly what this is a terrific example of. Um, and so you'll, you'll hear the details in a moment, but just to set up the relevance of this and what I hope that you'll be listening for from a uh, law.mit.edu context, 
Among other things, uh, this platform includes a language and an, an uh, ontology that makes it possible to express legal rules and legal processes in a way that you can um, kind of programmatically um, functionally execute within a system in, in a measurable um, and interoperable way. Uh, this is part of the dream of computational law to be able to uh, not have to have a lawyer interpret, you know, um, like human language in um, who knows exactly what ways in software, but instead to be able to start to have that um, two way integration between what the um, how the technical system um, and the legal system um, express the same rules and processes. Um, and, and part of what's so precious about this is it really is working backwards. Here's, this is a, a, gonna be a familiar theme today from business imperatives, which is, you know, we have laws and uh, that, that, are, that compel um, adherence to certain privacy rules. Uh, and, and, uh, and there's a value proposition here that is hardly academic um, that, that, uh, behind this platform. Uh, and, and so now uh, with that high level context, uh, and I don't wanna do any spoilers, uh, I, I, it's my pleasure and uh, really my honor to, uh, to introduce Killian to, uh, if, and actually I'm gonna ask you if you could introduce yourself a little bit and, and the context before we dive into the platform. And just as a special request, if we could sort of like the ID Federation leave some, um, some time for Q and A, um, I know firsthand from the email traffic the last few days. There's people that have a lot of questions for you. So with that, um, take it away. That, thank you, Daza. Oh, can you guys hear me? Okay, can you, you can yep, hear me? Okay. Loud. Yep. Okay. Good. Um, thank you, Daza. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you all for for um, having me. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. I'm very excited to speak to you. Um, as Daza asked, I'll, I'll very quickly introduce myself. And then we'll dive in because there's a lot of ground to cover and, and hopefully lots of questions and discussions to have. So I'm Killian, I'm the founder and CEO at Ethica. Um, just sort of to give you a brief rundown of my history. So my background's physics and CS, nowhere near as prestigious as, as MIT. I went to a college in, in Ireland um, and uh, unfortunately dropped out in my final year. My mother's still very sad about that 20 years later. Um, and I founded my first business. I, my end of year thesis became my first business, which was a uh, data infrastructure business. We built analytics tooling for legacy enterprise. We deployed on-prem in customer infrastructure um, before contemporary enterprise SaaS or cloud existed. Um, and I ran that business for about 12 years. Um, and effectively, we worked with the largest consumer packaged goods and household brands in the world. So companies like Unilever and Heineken and Coca-Cola. Um, effectively providing analysis across their distributed systems in an industry that was evolving very rapidly. <clears throat> and a big part of that was compliance, right? Um, at the time, you might not have thought it was the GDPR, but just risk mitigation related to the way that you were using the data, right? And it's a very unsophisticated time if you think back to the early 2000s. So uh, sort of fast forwarding a little, my business was acquired, I took some time off and I started working on what I'm gonna share with you today um, because I had seen this problem firsthand and by problem, I, again, I should emphasize, I'm not a lawyer, not a policy expert of any kind. In fact, I consider myself a dunce, um, but I do understand data infrastructure pretty well, and particularly the commercial end of that. So what happens in real businesses in the real world when they increasingly bolt on sort of additional systems and subprocessors to generate materialized views and end up in a the mess that we currently find ourselves in. And so the tools that I started working on um, a number of years ago were predicated on the idea of I suppose Lessig's code is law, right? Like this idea, or law is code rather, that you could in some way translate one to the other, that it should be possible because both are primitives to describe rules of some kind or conditions of some kind. Um, and so what I'd like to take you through today is the, uh, well, from my perspective, for me personally, it's six years work. Uh, for Ethica, we're three years old. So as a company, it's three years of work. They were launched publicly in November as a set of open source tools. And I'd love to take you through our thinking behind them the sort of rationale for how we believe that you solve those problems and then show you some practical examples. Um, so in order to do that, can I, um, is it possible for me to drive and share screens, does it, or is that, um, because I was going to use an ID, an editor for a while as well, is that, a, is that okay? I, I think so. Um, tr yeah. try, to, try to do a screen share and see, see let's double works. If you can't, then we can make it happen. Oh, there you go. Oh, we yep. can. Looking awesome, good. excellent. Okay, so let me dive straight in and, um, and present. Uh, the only reason I'd like to do this is because I'm going to be jumping in and out of this and showing you a, um, a live demonstration as well. Um, so 
Um, actually, let me just open up the chat window to make sure I see any questions that might pop up. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna take you through very quickly is when I say the problem, it's not the only problem, but the one that we see. Um, so the issues of trust and privacy in software development at large, um, the way we see that solution, which is Fidesz, um, the benefits of this, what we call a privacy as code approach, or probably more concretely, a governance as code approach. And then I'll show you two real world examples that will hopefully bring to life the capability of the tools and then give you a, a glimpse into the roadmap of what we're building and some of the capabilities that that will provide. Um, <clears throat> so, so the problems with trust in, in sort of software development is, I, I think we'll probably all agree with this at some sort of personal level, privacy at a, at a fundamental level should be a feature of every technology system, right? It should be just a, an imbued characteristic or behavior of the system, but it's not, right? Like that's not the reality of the world that we live in. In fact, for most developers, uh, even those that care deeply about privacy, it just creates a lot of friction and complexity, right? Like it's a lot of pain and reality for them to implement uh, because they're not privacy experts or legal experts. They are engineers first and foremost, there to serve a different business function. Um, and the source of the pain of privacy comes from how we build software and when we think about governance in most scenarios. And I say most because there are always exceptions. Um, this is the software development life cycle, right? The virtuous cycle of building things, right? So we're all familiar with this idea of design, uh, technical design of a product or system, the implementations so of the coding of it, uh, eventually you'll test it to some degree and eventually you'll deploy it. And if you think of the, the sort of venture backed world in which we've lived, particularly for the last 30 years around technology, um, the hope is that you'll deploy quickly uh, and accumulate users, right? Uh, lots of users, lots of growth, success in the technology you've built. But that becomes the sword on which you fall, right? You suddenly have data which creates a risk to you from a governance perspective. And that's when you start to think about privacy, right? So you uh, invite in legal specialists, experts in the law. Um, when they look at the privacy regulations around the world, they start to talk about data discovery because they don't know what data is in your infrastructure, data mapping and cataloging, inventory management, risk analysis, data subject rights, all of these sort of nuanced aspects of various privacy regulations. The thing that's curious about this approach, though, is it's happening post hoc, right? That is to say the system was deployed, it was designed with certain behaviors and characteristics, none of which considered these regulations that came in the future. And so it's, a, it's sort of one part anachronistic and the other just an ignorance towards these problems until a state at which they're a critical issue for the business. And so you could look at it not as privacy, right, but general governance issues, right? Governance is imposed on an organization typically of a certain size. And the challenge to that is there's a low degree of education uh, earlier in the development cycle of an early stage startup, for example. And so what is governance asking of these engineers in many cases, right? Is well, tell me what's in these databases, what's in this infrastructure, how is it being used? Essentially provide context to the systems we have so that we can govern them. The issue is uh, one that is being dealt with downstream, right? Downstream being sort of away from the event. Um, and where it actually occurred, the problem occurred was when the code was written. So what I mean by that is, uh, there's a common label uh, amongst our customers, I won't name which ones for, for our paid products, um, they call the infrastructure that they don't know anything about orphan data. And that's a label that many of them use, many different businesses, to identify infrastructure at scale, like petabytes of data, that they don't really know enough about. They can't turn it off because it might break something. Uh, you know, the rotation of engineers, uh, inconsistent documentation, bad management, and there's this lacking context on their infrastructure. So they start to spelunk in that data to try and identify what's there. The question they should be asking is how have they arrived at that outcome where they're having to boil the ocean to understand what data is there in order to govern it and it's like i say back upstream right in the software development life cycle we don't ask developers or provide tools for developers to build systems that could support governance of any kind uh, and so our goal when we were designing these tools uh, and this journey started as i said a long time ago for me six years ago three years as a company um was to uh, see if we could bake governance or privacy into the software development lifecycle so that systems could shape with the capabilities to support not just current regulations, but sort of future state evolving regulations. And sort of the concrete way that we sort of articulate that to businesses is if you think about your tech stack, you've got your front end, your back end, right? Angular, Vue, React as a front end, you could have Python, Node, Java, Scala as a back end, any number of databases, some kind of version control system and infrastructure as code to deploy into the cloud. The privacy and policy function in very large organizations, the governance function, might have some role in the software development lifecycle to evaluate risk. But in truth, it's sort of two asynchronous, very manual processes running in parallel, right? Um, what we were proposing is that you create a layer in your technology systems that is designed just for governance. 
So a privacy is code layer that allows you to police the behavior of these systems and write new rules or conditions on them in the future, such that you can ensure trust in the behavior of those systems to comply with external regulatory factors or internal business policies. So <clears throat> the belief that we had was that we could solve this with a, an open source standard, privacy as code or governance as code approach. And so what I'd like to take you through is how that works. Um, so first of all, just a little bit about Fides. Um, Fides was named such because it's the Roman goddess of trust for those that are interested. Um, it's essentially a lightweight description language, right? It's a, uh, uh, if you're familiar with uh, some of the infrastructure as code languages like Terraform and Puppet, it's not dissimilar. Uh, and what I mean by that is not the grammar is the same, but the behavior is the same, right? If you think about the purpose of Terraform, Terraform is intended for engineers that know a lot about what they want to deploy into the cloud, but may not know about the understand or underlying mechanics of how that is functioning, right? Uh, I can deploy databases with Terraform without worrying about how they're scaled horizontally. AWS takes care of that. So in many respects, if you think about it, Terraform is an abstraction that allows me to act on very sophisticated hardware systems with the confidence that those will be executed consistently. I just need to be able to write Terraform. And so Fides is the same, but for governance constructs, it allows me to describe characteristics of systems so that I can police and enforce on those now and in the future. It, in a simple form, when we talk about it today, because we focus on privacy, but it's intended for all governance conditions, it allows you to add privacy or governance directly into your CI pipeline and your runtime environment. And I'll explain the distinctions in a moment. The benefits are hopefully becoming reasonably obvious as we go through this. <clears throat> it's a developer-friendly language, right? So one of the issues with governance as a, as a concept is it's not something we teach engineers about, so we sort of hit them with a stick over time to do things for us. Um, so this language lowers the bar for entry, right? Uh, developers can adopt this very easily without understanding all of the underlying mechanics of each policy or condition that they need to meet. They can write this language very simply, and I'll show you that in a moment. Um, it provides tools that integrate the ability to check policy in Git and in the CI pipeline. So what I mean by that is you're actually tracking decisions you make related to policy as you write code, and you can evidence that. So if you think of the concept of an audit trail that might allow you to look at the history of the decisions you made in the systems you built, you can actually do that. It's sort of like Git history for governance, right? Like what are the decisions we made and why over time? Um, and because of that, we have the ability to build tooling on top of it to execute tasks, right? We can check risks in the CI pipeline um, and in the runtime environment where data is being queried, we now have context over what it is so we can execute tasks, right? So we could anonymize data consistently across a system on a given date or time because of a retention policy. We might respond to a request to erase a user. And these are all possible because we have the context to do that with this metadata language. It's essentially coursing through the system intravenously, right? <clears throat> and one of the last capabilities that VDIS has today is it supports sort of very hard, large scale de-identification, particularly for machine learning models. And we can talk about that at the end of this time. And um, so the benefits, structurally, um, it's composed of a simple number of sort of primitive system resources. There's the language itself, VDIS Lang, um, which is the taxonomy, ont uh, the ontology, and the sort of grammar with which you can actually describe system characteristics and policies. Um, then there's VDIS Control, which is the uh, systems that run in the code management environment. I say systems plural because they're, it's composed of two components. There's a server that runs either locally in your development environment or for multiple developers as a hosted application. And there's a CLI tool and the CLI tool allows the engineer to interact very quickly with the control server. And then there's Fides Ops or operations, <clears throat> which is the data orchestration tool. Um, so think of Fides Ops as a, a task runner for very complex governance requests. So you can give it a policy to um, pseudonymize certain data or delete things or move things around under certain policies or conditions, and it will execute those consistently in whichever way it needs to, either in response to a request or a time-based condition, for example. So let's dig into these a little bit more. Um, the benefits of this approach should be very evident at this point, right? Because we now can describe our systems, right? Um, we can declare, in effect, in the software development lifecycle terms, we can create a very simple way for our developers to declare what they're doing, right? Their intention. I intend to build a system that will perform these tasks and activities with these types of data. Because we can declare that context very clearly, we can evaluate it, right? Like, is that an acceptable thing to be doing with those types of information? Does it either meet the organizational organization's policies or external regulations that we need to comply with? And we can enforce, we can stop it, we can check it in the CI pipeline. And I know I'm speaking to an audience that is familiar with this, we're all familiar with the famed Facebook FTC consent decree. 
people focus on the $5 billion fine that Facebook got that's honestly irrelevant in the context of this conversation. What's interesting is that the meat of that decree states that Facebook essentially needs to impose what you might call the sort of digital equivalent of Sarbanes for engineers, which is like some kind of audit trail that allows you to evidence the decision-making and the enforcement process around risk mitigation when you build software, not after it's deployed. Like we're not asking you to stop data flowing to a database. We wanna make sure you don't ever build a system that allows data to flow to those places if it shouldn't. So enforcement in the CI pipeline and the, the audit trail to do that. And the mapping part that's interesting is because you're able to enforce this in the CI pipeline, if you think about it, you now have this very crisp metadata layer about all of the um, behaviors of each system and service in consort. So you have a very real-time mapped view of information flow in the organization. So you, essentially what you've got, right, if you think about it, is the ability to mitigate risk in the software development lifecycle, the ability to audit that uh, sort of trail of decision making, and a consistent data inventory across your deployed infrastructure when you do deploy it. So now what you have effectively, right, is context and tools to control it. So you now have governance built into the system, right? Like if, you, if this were possible, this privacy as code, Panacea, you, you'd uh, effectively be able to enforce anything you wanted to now or in the future, whether it's for the GDPR or some you know, obscure regulation that comes along in 10 years' time. So that's a very high level view of, of Ethical, what I, or of Fidesz, apologies. So what I'd like to do now is actually show you some concrete examples. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump out of this document. Um, it's gonna get a little technical. I hope you'll uh, um, forgive me for that, but we'll dig in to show you how it works. Um, we will and hopefully... applaud and salute you for that, not just forgive you. <clears throat> okay, awesome, excellent. Um, so in order to do that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk you through the first example, which is enforcing a policy while you're developing something, All right? So this is, um, the typical data protection impact assessment workflow proposed by the CNIL in France that tech companies should follow when they're building something, right? Uh, it's a giant Rube Goldberg machine of steps that should be taken to evaluate what you're building, is there a risk around the data you're collecting, how are you using it, should it go back to another risk evaluation with another policy owner, um, and, and, and it runs through sort of every business unit in the typical organization with the uh, essentially the objective of creating a very detailed paper trail of the decisions being taken in a sort of privacy by design-esque way, right? Um, but if you think about it, what we're basically looking at here is, okay, we wanna build something, it might collect some data, what risks do we wanna avoid? We need context about it, we need to evaluate risk, we need to analyze that, identify it. We then need to look at the risk related to the severity of if that data were breached or compromised, the likelihood of that happening, triage the risk against that. And if that is occurring, identify the high risk ones and attempt to mitigate them. So go back loop. And this is in a well-oiled organization, the steps we should be taking, right? There's no other better way. The way we look at this at Epic is completely different with our tools from FIDES. And again, remember FIDES is completely open source. So what I'm talking about here isn't a platform or product you buy. These are tools intended for every developer. And our goal here is common adoption. And I'll talk about that much more. Um, but just to explain what you're looking at, if you look at it sort of from top left corner across, um, so the first row is sort of the, the, you could say the sort of executive level or GRC functions of an organization that often decide the business decisions um, and the organization's direction, right? Uh, they're the ones probably responsible for writing policies that can and cannot do things, right? You've then maybe got business unit owners or product line owners or feature owners who are defining how you might be using data effectively. That's what they do, right? We want to use data for these per particular purposes. And then you've got engineering teams that are effectively designing, coding, testing, deploying things. So Fidesz Control lives on the left side, and it's basically got the ability to allow the GRC function to write a policy in Fidesz, right? Describe a condition. It allows but let's say business owners or feature owners or product owners to describe data uses, so purposes of use of data, and allows engineers to describe the exact data they're using, types of information they're acting on. And it's able to use all of those uh, components of context to effectively evaluate risk and enforce policy for the organization. So that's the part I wanna start on. We'll get to the runtime side afterwards. So in this demonstration, what we're gonna do is we're gonna essentially do exactly those things. We're gonna describe or show how we describe a very primitive system, it's very ugly. And within that, we're gonna use our taxonomy and we're gonna look at the taxonomy in a moment to understand how we do that. We're gonna check our system against some policies that we've already written and then essentially fail a compliance check um, and update our system to comply with that regulation. So those are the steps we're gonna go through. <clears throat> so I'm gonna jump out of um, this Google doc for a moment. Um, I've got a VS Code open here and I should just explain what's uh, in front of you. Um, uh, 
well, actually, let me let me provide better context. We've, what we've got here essentially is a fictional system, um, uh, a, a Flask application uh, running a fictional e-commerce uh, site. It's not very pretty, right? But you can see there's some products here. I'm logged in as user at example.com, that's me. So I've already got an account. That means this system already has in a database my name and password, at least that, probably more, but at least that, right? Um, so let's say, for example, that I decide to buy a product. So I'm gonna click purchase. I'm gonna check out, and in air quotes, this is not a very pretty system. Um, there's no validation and there's no credit card, but we get the checkout flow. I've now given it an address, I've bought a product. So notionally a database behind this thing now contains some information about me, right? So in, for the purpose of this demonstration, I essentially have uh, this e-commerce application running locally uh, with a Postgres database sitting behind it. Um, and it's very, very simple. So that's enough context about the system that we're playing with here. Um, now, what we have open here in front of us before I get to our taxonomy in detail are uh, what we call manifest declarations in Fides. So uh, declarations are essentially what they sound like. They are a statement of uh, the design of a system or its behaviors. So if you look at the label on this one, it says it's a Postgres data set. So this is describing my database. Now, here this will look dense because we're describing an entire database. But if you think of the workflow of most developers, they only need to describe a few fields that they're working on. So the aggregate work that several developers do gives us the context of exactly what's in that database, right? So 10 developers working on a large data set might describe thousands of tables over time, but we're all incrementally adding to that. These files that you're looking at live in a project repository with the work you're doing. So this lives alongside the code base that supports the application. So this one describes our data set. This one describes our system. Now, for the purpose of simplicity here, we're describing our entire e-commerce application in one file. Uh, you could, in, in sort of a real production environment, you might think of this as distinct declarations that describe services in a service-oriented architecture or components of an application. You can sort of use it in several ways, but the goal is to describe each system. Uh, then in fact, in the next release of Fides, you'll be able to inline these descriptions directly in your code base. And there's a linter that picks up the, the declarations directly in whatever code you're writing. Uh, so whether it's like Python or Scala or Rust or Go. Um, so, so this is how we write our declarations. Now, before I show you the grammar in these, I'll just explain the taxonomy a little bit. So um, this is the Fides Explorer. I'll actually paste this in the chat um, very quickly. Um, uh, so this is just a, a, a taxonomy explorer. I'll have it on screen, but you might, might be easier to look at it yourself. And this is the public documentation for the project. So just to explain what you're looking at, um, the language is modeled uh, to support the GDPR today, the CCPA, the LGPD in Brazil, um, and it also supports standards like ISO 19944, so privacy information management systems for cloud information providers and service providers. So it's intended to be very robust for, for commercial use. It's also extremely extensible, and that's by design, right? So the goal here is to have a common standard that everyone uses. And then if you want to extend the taxonomy, you can do so, but you must extend from the top level primitive resources. And the reason for that, and I'll explain it later in a, the diagram I have, is so that we can have interoperable go governance between external systems, right? If we are describing our data consistently across all organizations, we have the ability to effectively govern or impose policy on multiple systems. I'll show you that in a moment, but let's just look at the taxonomy very quickly. So you'll see here, uh, the one that we'll focus on is personal information for a moment. So, so we've got user data, um, then we could just declare this as user derived data. So that is something synthesized about the user or, or inferred about the user uh, within the system's operations. Uh, or we could uh, specify that it's provided data. So it's actually input by the user. They knowingly enter that information. And then we declare whether that's identifiable data or non-identifiable data. And then we get into details to fine grain information, right? Is it contact data? Is it genetic, gender data, driver's license, government IDs, very specific types of government IDs, et cetera. And the goal of this is to provide context on how a system or service, like a single service, it's IO, effectively it's inputs, so data it receives at the interface level, and data it, uh, that essentially uh, sends out or ejects or data egress, uh, what it is. So we know what types of data we're handling and where transposition of data types occurred. Right? So this is the what data are we handling. The next is why. Uh, what are we using the information for? Like, why are we using this data? Are we using it to... Uh, do advertising, first party advertising for contextual purposes? Are we doing third party sharing where we're selling that data for personalized advertising? Are we using it to optimize our systems? So this is the context at the, context at the business level for what we're using the data for. 
Um, and the next is data subjects. Uh, so these are the types of users data that might exist in the system. And this matters because it informs how we might police or govern the, the way in which that data is used. And finally, data qualifiers. Now data qualifiers is visually hard to see in the um, Explorer because it's a flat uh, spectrum, but essentially data qualifiers is a linked, uh, you could call it a linked set of nodes that describe a spectrum of identifiability. So you can think of it as a risk qualifier for the degree of identifiability that a data set gives. So for example, uh, anonymous data is truly that, like absolutely anonymous data. Uh, identifiable data is exactly that, identifiable data. The middle ground might be pseudonymized, but pseudonymized means many things. It's pseudonymized and unlinked. Is it de-identified? Is it partially anonymized? And these affect the, the risk of re-identification uh, of an individual, right? So these primitives are used in a dot notation form to describe our system's behaviors. Right? So if I go back to our code base, um, we can see if we look at the data, uh, the Postgres data set database, we can see there's three tables, a products table, a purchases table, and a users table. If I expand out the users table, you can see this, it's a, again, a very primitive example here. This is not a production environment. You can see we've got a, uh, a couple of columns in this table, uh, a created app, a uh, field name, uh, or an email address, a first name, an ID, a last name, a password. You'll see after that, then there's an object that contains the uh, FIDES annotations. So we can see here that the created at field is what is considered systems operations data, right? It's data on, uh, created by the system for the operations of the system. Whereas email address is uh, annotated as user provided identifiable contact email address, right? And we can add other labels if we want to identify it along multiple categories. And so this allows us to describe a system. So a developer, if they were adding a new column to a table, provides an annotation to it. That annotation lives with that record in perpetuity. Effectively, it's metadata appended to both a, a central server, a metadata server, and also directly to the data set. The system declaration is slightly different, right? The data set is just declaring what is data at rest in a database, for example. But the system declaration is actually describing the business purpose, right? So it's an e-commerce application, um, uh, sort of declaring something about the uh, conditions under which it executes. And then here we have the categories of data. And you'll see here, interestingly, the dot notation is very abstract. So we're just declaring that we're using both user provided identifiable data and user derived identif identifiable data. We could be more narrow if we knew that our system was only acting on contact information, or we could say it's only dealing with email addresses, right? So we can very quickly describe the types of data that we're handling in our systems. So as a developer, I can just declare these. Beneath that, then I've got the use. So how, why am I using this data? We've given one simple one here. We've just said that we're using this information to provide systems operations. Uh, that's a, uh, a, a style of grammar that comes from ISO 19944. So systems operations is anything that just sustains the capability of a service uh, in its simplest form. And the data type we're acting on is customers. And the qualifiers to its degree of identifiability is that this is fully identified data, right? This will identify an individual. So we've, we've got this. Now we're going to paint this fictional picture very quickly, which is I'm an enterprising developer. I work in this company. I have decided I'd like to add Google Analytics to my e-commerce system so I can infer lots of information about my users and help us improve our product. So I add the Google Analytics snippet to my, uh, my code base, and I decide I'm going to declare um, that I'm using Google Analytics. I need to declare that code because it'll be undeclared. It won't check in our commit. Now, we've detailed this with a lot of comments, so it looks very dense, but if you look at it very carefully, what I've basically said in my declaration here is I want to add Google Analytics. It's a third-party system type. Um, I'm going to be uh, processing browsing history, cookie IDs, telemetry data, location data, and some non-identifiable data, and I'll be using that data to improve my system's capabilities, like observing and improving. Now, I've defined another use of data down here, which is I want to figure out their geographic location. And so I've said that I want to use their device IP address, their location, and some identifiable data to um, figure out where the user is. Now, here's a common mistake that happens. Developers don't really know what personal data is, right? Most developers aren't responsible for this. So most developers don't know that an IP address under the GDPR is personal data. So I'm going to attempt to check in my code uh, where I've declared that I'm using this personal data. So I'm gonna just, uh, I should point out, because this is a developer environment, my, my local dev environment, I'm not running it in the CI pipeline. So I'm gonna manually kick off the same thing as what would happen in a commit in your normal CI pipeline. So I'm basically just gonna run a command to execute a, a FIDES evaluation. So what's gonna happen here is it's gonna spin up the FIDES server. 
It's going to connect to the policies, review all available policies for the organization, review my declarations as a developer in my code base, and check that I'm not doing anything that's illegal or inappropriate, let's say. Oh, I've got a red fail. Um, so we can see here the red fail basically says, um, I'm attempting to use Google Analytics, and I'm attempting to do so in a way that does not comply with our data minimization policies. That's not acceptable. We cannot check this code in. So I, I'm now going to show you the policy that enforces this condition. So we have a primitive policy. Um, and basically, it's again using FIDES to describe what we want to do. And basically, it's a, minim, a data minimization policy. And it essentially says, look, we want to reject the collection of any user identifiable data for anything other than system operations. Basically, you can collect user data to operate an e-commerce system. But if you want to use it for things like improve, in personalizing the system, advertising it, third-party sharing, gener generic collection, or training an AI system, that's a no-no. We do not permit that as an organization. And we don't permit it on any of these groups of data, provided identifiable data or derived identifiable data. So as a developer, I get this notice that I can't do this. So I've got to go and figure out what I'm going to do. I've got to make a business decision and change my code base. I'll go away and look at my code base. I find out that Google allows me to anonymize the last octet of an IP address. So now I'm no longer handling um, uh, identifiable data. I'm handling pseudonymized data. We could debate the degree of pseudonymization that affords, I agree. But for the purpose of this simple uh, example, we'll all get there. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to essentially run my check again. So I'm going to evaluate my code base. I've made my code changes. I've updated my policy or my declaration. It's going to check it against the enforceable policies. And I get a, hopefully, a pass. I get an evaluation passed. So my code can be checked in. It generates a commit. It generates an audit trail report on what was evaluated in the policies, what decisions were concluded, and allows the code to continue through. So to go back to our, um, our original presentation here, um, what we've done here is describe our systems with this primitive language, so the context of them. We've checked our systems against a policy we had written previously. And then I've, at a very basic level, updated my system to comply with the, the organization's state of policies. So what, in effect, we've done here, if I go back to our sort of virtuous software development lifecycle, I have prevented a, a piece of code being deployed and ever touching data um, for not complying to a policy before it ever gets to production. Most of the time, this happens after we discover we failed in some way. Right? So um, we're going to take you from there into use case two. Uh, which is a very specific one and shows you the sort of runtime environments. This is about individual rights. Um, uh, for those that are not familiar very quickly, under various privacy regulations, consumers or users are afforded rights, uh, employees as well, actually any subject type, such as the right of access to the data, the right of erasure, et cetera. And these are very difficult to uh, programmatically execute for the reasons we talked about, right? Most businesses don't know what data is where. So if Daza or Brian or Brendan or anyone else on the list of uh, people watching here says, hey, uh, YouTube, give me my data back. YouTube's got to go spelunking for Daz's data in the hope that they don't miss some of it, right? It's a painful, highly risky process. Um, also, this is what they normally look like. Data subject requests are like written documents, emails. It's a, this is a real one, I should point out. This is a legitimate request. I can't name who it's from. Um, and this is, this is sort of what you're dealing with, this sort of bizarrely anachronistic process for these very sophisticated data-driven systems. So this is what the request looks like. And this is what it looks like for most organizations. So what I mean by that is a business receives a request on the left, right? They have to triage it in some way. They generate a ticket. They evaluate it. They review it. Uh, support teams huddle around it. They panic because they've got to find the data. Eventually, they probably generate some internal tickets in JIRA. And every business unit owner is notified to go and retrieve data by Killian or Daza. And that could be automated. Maybe they've written some scripts to retrieve data from Redshift or Postgres or Snowflake. But then they've got to go like really looking under the carpet and searching all of the sources of data that they don't know about. It becomes very manual very quickly. So what I'm going to show you here is how we execute privacy requests in a runtime environment using FIDES. So we can construct a request policy, which is quite literally that. It's a policy about how we would like to treat requests for users. It doesn't have to be just a request from a user, right? The example I'm using to show the tools is one generated by a human being. But when we say policies here, it could be a condition internally that's about anonymizing records after 32 days, 32 and a half days of holding them. We, we, we've decided we want to erase all of these types of data from our taxonomy. So we're going to get rid of anything that falls under the derived category. We're going to get rid of all of that in the 32nd day. We want to be able to enforce that consistently on all business systems, right? So in this case, we'll, we'll use the trope of the subject request. So um, I'm just going to show you the, the guts of what's happening in the system very quickly. 
So as we talked about, a data subject request normally flows into a sort of smorgasbord of ticketing systems. In this case, what's happening is the subject request can flow into a, a UI, like a privacy center we typically call them. So just a, a, an interface where a consumer and end user can input their request. It flows directly into an API driven data orchestration tool that is open sourced on top of the FIDES language. It's called FIDES Ops. And so you can configure this to accept certain identifiers, names, email addresses, phone numbers, device IDs, anything that you term an identifier for users in a distributed system. You can then construct a policy for how you would like it to handle those requests. So you write those policies in FIDES also. So I would like to only retrieve these types of data for these types of requests. I would like to erase these types of data for these types of requests. And you can also wire this to third-party systems. We mean subprocessors, right? So I can uh, trigger requests to uh, enforce these same conditions into a Stripe or a HubSpot or a Salesforce, et cetera. So let's actually do this in practice. So again, we've got our fictional e-commerce system, if you recall. I uh, bought a product. So I'm in here as user at example.com. Um, and so now what we're going to do is we're going to um, get more room for myself. Um, I'm now going to uh, make a request here in the same way. Now, the difference is I've got no UI, so we're just doing this at the data engineering level. So I'm basically using my CLI, and I'm basically going to say to the FIDES server, we'd like to create a, uh, a policy and a request, right? So you know, FIDES ops. So we're going to make a request. It's going to spin up the servers. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, that's strange. Did I type up something? I think my... Um, so let me just double check my server is still running. That's why they say never do live demos, right? Um, there we go. Um, okay. So <clears throat> now, hopefully, I know this text is not very big. I'll, I'll zoom in a little bit maybe to help see it a bit better. Hopefully, you can see that. So you'll see here, um, we're doing this from the CLI. Um, but the way you can think about this is you can essentially, in YAML files, configure the conditions under which you want to execute a request. So you'll see here, it's asking me to enter a list of the data, tar the target data categories for this request policy. So what this means, if I go back to the taxonomy, I can pick categories, multiple categories or single categories of data I would like to retrieve or erase. And I can design the erasure policy, uh, the types of erasures executed. Um, and it supports a bunch of different things like HMAC, random number generation, and you can compound those together. Um, you can unlink documents uh, so that you can create sort of true, true breakages in, in the foreign keys and reference IDs. Um, but in this simple example, I'm going to retrieve some data, right? That's what I want to do. So for the first one, what we're going to do is we're just going to get all of the data we have about our user. Anything that relates to this individual, we'll just get everything. So we'll just use the top level user target category, this one here. So instead of declaring anything, we'll just say user. And now I'm going to provide an email address. Now, this might flow in through an API, but I'm just going to provide it here. So it's user at example.com is our test user. So you'll see here it's uh, returned to us essentially a JSON object with everything related to this user. So the products they've purchased, any address they've entered over time to purchase products, et cetera. Okay. Um, and the specific user information, including their password, in fact, which is obviously scary. We don't want to return things like that, right? Um, so what we've done there is just return everything about the user. At a practical level, that's not really the kind of policy we want to enforce, right? We're going to run something very specific. Maybe we say, actually, we would like to return um, only the city about the user. So we're going to return the user provided identifiable contact city. So I'm going to create a new, pol uh, new policy. I'm going to say we're going to do user uh, provided uh, identifiable contact city. And so now when it executes a request against this user, it's only going to retrieve the New York data sets and any of the addresses. That's all we can get. Now, it's a very simple example. We can, like I said, create like a very sophisticated uh, execution task to erase data consistently across systems. You can use it to enforce a condition like not allowing data to flow between systems. And we can talk about how ACLs work here in a little bit. Um, but that's a, a sort of a quick sort of tour of that. So if I go back to our, our document again, what we've done there essentially is we've constructed a request policy. We've retrieved all of the data for a user. We've modified that policy to retrieve a subset of data, just some contact information about the user. So you can sort of see the power of how you can use the grammar to execute sort of pretty complex tasks. So the last thing, I know we're tight on time. The last thing I'm going to say is just a bit about the future of FIDES. So if you're following here, what we've basically done is we've gone really far upstream and started the software development lifecycle. And we're working our way down to all of the problems that an organization faces in governance. One of the biggest ones is enforcement between distributed systems, ones you may not own, right? This is typically what it looks like, right? And this is an oversimplification here, but if I, if I present it very quickly. 
So you've got multiple users potentially into multiple applications. And let's think about these applications as separate companies for a moment. And so the way in which you deal with this typically, right, is APIs are connected between systems, but to mitigate the risk of data processing between them, we have a data processing agreement. So we have a legal document between two entities that defines or codifies our, both, uh, our intended or expected outcomes of how we might use data on both sides. So the API is the connection between both systems, but the DPA is in fact, in fact the enforceable document, right? And it's not connected in any way to the API, right? Like they're distinct things, right? So it's fine when a user's data flows in here and it flows to another company, we have a DPA. But if the user starts to change their preferences about how they want that data handled, like their decisions, right? And how they want their data handled. Now their preferences flow in here. And now the DPA needs to be enforced and maybe it becomes very micro, right? Like one user's preferences are different to another. How would we enforce those business conditions consistently across multiple companies? It's essentially impossible, right? That no system could support that promise today. Now imagine for a moment, if you thread all of these systems together with a consistent taxonomy and grammar, right? Like if you can describe consistently the way data exists in each of these systems, actually uh, the enforcement layer is the API, right? The API becomes the contract. Both APIs for both systems are their own data processing agreement, right? They declare the types of data they touch, the conditions under which they use that information and for what purpose. And those APIs can constrain access to that information for those reasons. So in fact, the next step what we're working on in FIDA is, is specifically these capabilities, the ability to essentially semantically enforce across distributed systems, provided both organizations have described things using the language. Um, so we've covered the problem, a bit about FIDES, the benefits of this approach, two use cases, and a little glimpse into what we're working on at the moment for the future of the tools. I'm going to stop there and happy to answer any questions and obviously plead with you all to go and uh, clone the repos, play with the tools, ask any questions, create lots of issues and give us lots of constructive or, or terrible feedback. That would be great too. Here, here. Um, wow. What that was such a tour de force. Um, and there's so much in that. And I just wanna uh, just congratulate you for doing fundamentally a live demo in the CLI, posing a different question and then limiting the data that came back using a, like an on the fly dot language to narrow down you know, the, 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 um, the sub subcategories of, um, of functionality against data. Like uh, that is just freaking amazing. <laughs> um, so thank you. Thank you so much for showing us what's Pleasure. possible, and uh, and then in particular what what's what's available now in the context of this um, personal data um, and privacy um, realm. So, um, okay, as as the questions and comments are rolling in, I'll, I'll go ahead and get us started. Uh, sure. So, uh, so one thing I want to highlight that um, from. That, that you just sort of slipped in toward the end there was um, the API, you know, in effect um, becomes the agreement. Um, yes. So part of what we, what, what's so interesting about that is um, if, you, if you look from, just put a legal hat on for a moment, uh, if you will, uh, or I'll deputize you to put a legal hat on, um, like you've got a, uh, a the, this um, legal primitive uh, called a contract. Um, you can't have a contract with yourself. It takes two or more parties to agree. Okay, fine. So what happens today? Uh, usually you've got a contract that's like in a paper paradigm, like maybe it's digital, maybe it's a PDF, but it's between you know two or more organizations and it's like moldering somewhere in like a drawer or like a buried in a C drive. And, you know, and they, and did, but do the engineers look at it, you know, and uh, just double check all the terms before they do anything? No. Does anyone does it, like, you know, do, do, and do they, look at it. And, and do, do, to be kind to an engineer, but do they often even understand them? Like it's just not their domain of expertise necessarily, right? So just so, just so. And so what we have is a um, kind of continental drift between what the, the, the contract is and what is actually happening. Now, meanwhile, if, you, if we took an engineering approach to this, we would say, well, what, what is the, what's the most convenient you know, at hand intersection point operationally between the organizations? That's where, I would, that's where I would like to see the business, legal and technical dimensions of the relationship collapse. Well, the API is a awesome expression of that. It's the gateway for the data interchange and the programmatic interchange between the entities. And it's very literally um, where we would like to um, not just express and execute the um, interchange between the systems, but it's also a really great place to situate the terms uh, 
uh, functionally of the agreement, like th they should be one in the same. And so I just think architecturally, your, your concept of, of like sort of placing the performance of the contract at the API is um, you know, like that alone should be like a master's class in law and, um, and, uh, and computer science. So okay, with that, let, let's move. Let's very move kind on. of you. The last thing, the last thing I'd say, Daz, just on oh, that yeah. point, not to, but it's just it's to that point. I think like the um, we there's prior form for this, right? Swagger documentation for APIs effectively describe not the legal construct of what you can do, but precisely what a system will do already. What we're asking you to do now is just enforce the next layer of those behaviors, right? Which is the stuff that we want to make business conditional. I, I don't think this is a huge leap. That's why we think we can get there over the course of the next year. So, um, yeah, we're very excited about it. Outstanding. So uh, one question, okay, looks like you're, you're ahead of me here, um, looking at them. So there was a question um, from uh, Luciana, uh, so many of mm -hmm. us from years past uh, at law.mit.edu you know her as Aura. Hi, welcome from uh, Brazil. You mentioned Brazil, by the way, we've got a whole Brazilian contingent with us today. So welcome, y'all. Awesome. Uh, could we get sort of a hands-on uh, workshop? And you kindly mm -hmm. said, uh, reach out and I guess I would just say, if you could see see me on that, I, I'd be happy to put it to course, our, it. yeah, to our, uh, so we can invite more people. I think there'll be a lot, there will there'll be a lot of interest in that, and including me. Like I would love to go to the next level and try to do install, config, and run, and just kind of see what happens. Um, happy to. I would love to. Any of you that would like to would be it would be a pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, Okay, and now we've got a kind of like um, high level uh, um, input from Brendan. What are the biggest challenges? And so if you, like, I know you've been really um, pushing to get this out. You, you just deployed it and, and, and announced it just a few weeks ago. But um, if you could take a breath for a moment and sort of look over the horizon, and I think Brendan said like 10 years, but I don't know, like, let's just say like, you know, one to five to 10 years, like, what do you, what do you kind of see mid and long term here? So I think the two sides, right? One is the challenges that we see and the other is where we think we're going with it. Um, so <clears throat> we like it might sound a little uh, hubristic and I promise I'm not, I'm like excited about what we're building, but I, uh, I'm i aware of how hard it'll be to get there. But the hope is that we effectively are uh, describing a language that will become increasingly sophisticated. We've kept it very primitive today in order to not scare developers off, right? Like the goal is actually to keep it as simple as possible intentionally. But, but we already have some grammar and syntax in there that allows us to describe very sort of very complex business or conditional constructs, right? Um, I think that over the next 10 years, if, if we get the adoption that we believe we'll have, we our view is that FIDES becomes essentially uh, this new layer of a tech stack, quite literally, in the way that I, you saw in the diagram, right? It's, it's essentially, you have a front end, you have a back end, you have data infrastructure, you have your deployed environment, you have the layer that... I, the best label we can come up with, which sounds salesy, it's not meant to be, but is, is trust infrastructure. And that is to say, what's the part of the system that allows us to trust in its overall behavior, right? Like a, a, you've promised a condition about how it will behave. How can you evidence that that is how it will behave to me, either within one system or across a, a number of distributed systems? So, so that would be the hope, right? And that's the sort of tenure ambition, I would say. Uh, to go back to the challenges that you asked about, I think, look, <clears throat> It's not lost on us. We're not we're not ego driven. It's not lost on us that many attempts to describe taxonomies for for either specifically privacy or the law over the last number of years, right? Like efforts in at sort of codifying law, um, and and they have not necessarily come to commercial success. So I think you'll probably all recognize the difference in this and some of the others is that we are very commercially focused. I don't mean about making money, but we're trying to appeal to businesses' benefits uh, in order to encourage adoption. And that creates its own challenges, right? Like there's a friction in that journey to educating customers so for those that aren't aware like we don't we literally don't sell anything but we spend a huge amount of money at the moment uh, deploying and educating large engineering teams at large companies that i don't think i should name so that we don't get into sales pitches but like very large social media companies um, very large banks to use these tools across their engineering teams um, the challenge in that is education uh, apathy towards governance today and so a lot of what we're trying to do is educate the importance of sort of trust and, and this idea that it's a hygiene factor, that good developers should care to build systems that are safe. Uh, you've heard me use the civil engineering analogy before, I think, Daza, which is, look, um, software in 30 years has quickly become essentially civil infrastructure, right? So, so software engineers today are society's civil engineers, right? We basically build uh, services that are deployed to production and are used by hundreds of millions of users uh, in moments. If civil engineers building bridges wore t-shirts saying move fast and break things, 
we would never cross those bridges, right? Because we expect, uh, you know, rigidity, uh, certain thresholds of safety to be met, et cetera, because it demands it because it's infrastructure that is important or critical to humanity. You could argue that software is faster approach to that point and we don't have the same controls or capabilities in those systems. And so the goal here isn't to beat engineers over the head, it's to give them tools to help them make it very easy to not have an excuse to not build safe systems, respectful systems. Yes, outstanding. Um, and so we've got one more uh, uh, question that has come in uh, from our co-instructor and longtime collaborator um, and friend, um, uh, Tony Lai. Uh, and so Tony, I wanna invite you to, there you are, come off mute and, um, and, uh, and please yeah, ele elevate us to another level of the, like, the ecology of, uh, of uh, basically, you know, getting open source adopted in the bigger world. Uh, so go for it. Well, first off, Killian, absolutely brilliant project. Congratulations on where you've Thank taken you. it. And um, the, the demonstration there, I, I think, literally blew the minds of most people in this in the Zoom room. So thank you so much. Um, I was wondering, as you're talking about the uh, bringing on board various different uh, enterprises and then looking at the, in a sense, the evolution of regulation mm -hmm. more broadly, I was wondering, um, on the one hand, are policymakers and regulators currently aware of like the power of this standard and are they supporting its distribution? And then mm -hmm. I guess more broadly, how are you looking at the, the management and maintenance of this ecosystem that's gonna support this ongoing adoption? Uh, have you considered, uh, yeah, what kinds of incentives or you know, even mm -hmm. DAO-like mechanisms you might sort of put in place to, yeah. to support yeah. that? Great question, Tony. Um, so to sort of go through those in order, um, as it relates to dealing with or meeting with regulators or regulatory bodies uh, globally. We, candidly, we've only started that process. We made them aware of the project over the course of the last three years. But I think like any of these things, until you can see it and really it's sort of materially tangible to play with, um, it's difficult to understand. And also not to uh, be unfair, but I think there is a degree of sophistication needed to understand the underlying tooling that has been challenging in some of the regulatory bodies. It's improving very quickly. Um, so our hope is to over the course of this year, try and convince them to see the, the value of this as an open standard, right? So that's, a, I would say like a long-winded ongoing discussion that we're not there on yet. On the second point of how we will manage this going forward, I, I can't impress this enough. Uh, and I sound like some kind of evangelical, this will remain open source. My belief is the only way that this could ever succeed is that it is a readily adopted, easy to use standard that, every, that the vast majority of people do uh, tend to adopt. So it will be, uh, permanently in Apache 2 project, and the language is obviously a Creative Commons language. Today, it sits in Ethica, not for any reason to hold on to it, but we want to drive it forward. Uh, we have 30 engineers that just work on this project today, right? So that's all they do all day. It's a huge investment for us as a company, but it's, our entire company just works on that. We don't have any other part of the business anymore. They all just work on PDAs. Um, at a point in time, and I think that's over the next two years, we will form an essentially independent foundation, a charter governing body. And the bit we didn't kind of get into the details of is we have technical design partners who have essentially been the test bed users for these tools. So very large businesses that I unfortunately I can't name yet publicly, but like they're the types of companies that have the sort of deepest privacy issues that we all know of, right? Um, and they've been using these tools over the last two and a half years, three years, to allow us to get a feedback loop that allows us to better make them sort of easy to use for engineers, implement, et cetera. Part of that exchange is also that they would form part of the governing body in the future. If we were to do that too early, I think the agenda might get um, uh, might meander into the commercial interests of certain big enterprises. So we haven't allowed that to happen. The third part in terms of incentivization, it's a really interesting point. Today, we don't do anything per se to directly incentivize individual developers. What we do attempt to do is build lots of tools that ease the effort that developers have to go through, not with Fides, but with other efforts. So this becomes the logical uh, product or set of tools to use or platform to use. But we certainly haven't incentivized in the way that you said of like a DAO or something like that, which is a great idea, by the way. I, I hadn't thought of it um, for this. I don't know why I hadn't, um, but it's something we should consider. And I'm open to suggestions on how we encourage adoption or use always, I should put out. Great. Um, and so it looks like we've got um, some more here. Uh, thanks so much for a really great workshop. Came across the process uh, engrossed. Okay, so we, we're getting more uh, more fan email, I think, uh, here. Um, so, uh, Tony, did you have any any follow up um, on 
on that, and, and including if I don't want to put you on the spot too much, but I mean, you've got a ton of experience, Tony, with um, open source and you know standard setting, especially when there's a heavy legal overlay. If you have any suggestions, I mean, I think that would be in order as well. Well, I think the the, the broader uh, point you made about educating regulators and sort of like taking the time and the the space to 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 do that advocacy for these kinds of open standards is is going to be really interesting. I'm uh, Daz, as someone you're working very closely with, uh, Ben Moskovitz uh, at Consumer Pro, uh, um, Consumer Reports. I mean, their advocacy network, I think, would go to town on this because this fundamentally aligns with a lot of their work that they've been doing around uh, the CCPA and, and working with the, uh, the AG's office there. So I can see a lot of very, very interested uh, people who are going to want to jump in on this and, and, and help add to uh, this, this framework that you've put in place, which I think is, yeah, one of the most robust and, uh, you know, really played out scenarios of computational law and computational policy that that as you're saying already has these you know widespread adoption to the extent that you've been able to um sort of build that out as a business over the last few years and i think this approach now of uh being evangelical to the point of you know uh you know turning your entire team over to over this open sourcing effort i mean it, it, some might say you're bonkers i say you're like way ahead of the pack and i think that uh, you know, the more of us who can align with you around that kind of approach. Uh, and I think uh, uh, intuitively, the, a lot of the principles that, uh, that are part of the Web3 movement align with this, this approach. Mm -hmm. And so I think that you would get a lot of support if you were to set something like that up, you know, uh, you know consider with your foundation how you might, you know, involve a lot of that, that kind of activity. And I think that's some of what we'll be going on to talk, talk about in the next hour. But yeah, thanks again for, nice. for all the work. And yeah, look forward to staying in the loop very much if I can. Thank you, Tony. I really appreciate it. I appreciate the feedback. It's um, fantastic. Thank you so much. Outstanding. So um, I hope everyone will join me in, uh, in thanking Killian so much and, his, and the whole team at Ethica for, for the um, just the labor of love uh, in putting this open source platform together and supporting it and then making it uh, available for the world. And especially for taking your time in the middle of the day. I know you're incredibly busy uh, to, to share it in this session. Thank you so much. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Outstanding. And you're welcome to, I'm not sure what your day looks like, but our, our next session is uh, going to get a little bit crazy now. Uh, we're going to, so you began to touch on some governance things uh, in terms of the expression of policy. But if you go up one level from that, there's a question about, well, what is, what is the governance itself of an organization that outputs things like, uh, like policy and like rules uh, and, that, and that, you know, defines the business objectives? And when it, increasingly as organizations become, um, you know, digital um, largely, uh, they become not just digital, but network, they live as uh, components and processes that are um, automated. How, how do we incorporate governance as part of that? Um, and so, uh, oh, here comes Sulke. Uh, so not, not just how do we incorporate governance, but, but how, how can governance become um, um, refined such that we could compose governance as part of the technology of a system. When lawyers talk about, uh, oh, uh, Brian, I think if you don't mind doing the screen share, that would be great. Uh, when lawyers talking about, um, you know, um, kind of designing governance, uh, at least when I was uh, doing this stuff, when I was learning this stuff in the 90s, uh, we were talking about structuring governance. And the tools that we would use were, not surprisingly, Microsoft Word, and like maybe some diagrams at best. Um, but now, um, the, just like as we saw with the last session, as um, you know, privacy rules and personal data rules are, become, are becoming incorporated into the operation and the configuration of, uh, of the data management and the applications and the network systems of organizations, what, what would that look like for governance and specifically what would what would be the components of governance that we could mix and match and put together in sort of a, a modular way so that we could construct uh, or compose let us say a governance system for an organization or or if you look to the first session 
we had a lot of organizations together to help reform the insurance industry so that they could use the authentication service together. Um, there's a lot of governance there uh, that, that, that created and debated and evolves their system rules and the, um, the, the branding and the technology, you know, adopting new standards, the legal conditions. Um, you know, how, how could we compose systems for organizations and for organizations of organizations? Um, so uh, I'll, I'll say one bit of context, then I'm gonna hand it to Tony. And it's this word composable is so beautiful, partly because um, it has connotations you might not be familiar with. And I'll just highlight them now. Uh, there's a idea of composable systems and then a, a slightly more recent idea of composable services uh, that is part of the connotation I hope we'll take forward into this new context. And some of the key aspects there is, uh, if for those of you that are more technical, you may have heard of something called microservices before. Uh, the idea of composing microservices is that you can basically take bundles of functions and the, the word we use is decouple them so that they're independent or modular, and you can then combine them and sequence them into more sophisticated um, configurations of functions to, to create like a, a system or a meta system or a, or a set of applications uh, by the constituent parts that are encapsulated within a service. Um, you know, in system composition, uh, it doesn't have to be in a service like through an interface uh, or, or, or it could also be like, you know, functional components like an identity management system, a knowledge management system, like a billing system. You can, so long as there's a, a function that is modular, like a Lego block, and has like inputs and outputs so that you can integrate it together in different ways with other such modular components, uh, then, then we can begin to apply this higher level concept, the design concept of composing the system of these um, building blocks. So uh, with, with that um, kind of very high level setup, I, it, it is my, my uh, honor and my pleasure to introduce our colleague and our friend and uh, advisor uh, to the MIT Computational Law Report and stalwart longtime legal hacker, Tony Lai. Um, Tony, take it away. Thank you so much, Daza. Thank you, Brian. Uh, and fantastic to see you both, Noah and, and Megan as well. Uh, yeah, we have quite a, uh, a, a good uh, series of uh, historic uh, precedents for these kinds of jam sessions. Uh, and I'm, I'm really glad to be able to welcome more folks into them. And hopefully it can be the first of many such jam sessions that we can uh, take in various different directions. And this hour can hopefully just serve as a sort of a, a jumping off point uh, where we sort of dig into some interesting components. Uh, we'll throw it out to a few specific people who uh, are here with us as well. Uh, Silke, Isaac, uh, uh, various folks who have been deep into various different aspects of the practice of uh, composable governance in certain ways. Uh, through DAOs and, and, and know we're going to be able to uh, jump into some of the work that you've been doing as well in terms of uh, the management of DAOs, the, the ways that you activate uh, people in DAOs. Uh, but before I, I, I get into DAOs, uh, maybe I could just like take that step back and, 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 and give a quick introduction. Um, so uh, yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, on the introduction side, uh, the, the, the phrase you mentioned as a, about building blocks I think is uh, really applicable here in terms of this notion of composability so uh, so Brian can you just take it over to the next slide thanks um, we're talking about uh, at a base level this notion of uh, removing inefficiencies but uh, obviously we've also talked just now uh, with uh, Killian about this idea of enforcing policies in development and I think you know this is just one example of a whole Sort of wide series of inefficiencies that this promise of computational law uh, plays into. Uh, the idea of having at continuous integration or even at runtime this ability to uh, manage and understand whether or not you're, you're breaking some policy or you're going against some wider governance uh, uh, directive is, is part of this notion of being able to have these legal components that we're configuring and putting together. And so this question that we were talking about, Dazza, in, in some of our previous jam sessions is, you know, what are the kinds of platonic primitives, if we can speak of those, these, these solid state forms that, that might form components. And then I was thinking also about the, the polarity of uh, looking at things uh, as they are, 
uh, and, and looking at the things in the becoming. And so this idea of the dynamics, as well as like the platonic solids, you know, what are the events and the relationships and the dynamics of those that form any particular governance. And so I think this is the, uh, the, the piece where I wanted to pl play in a little bit, and I think the operative word is play, uh, into this idea of Lego law, because it's not just about composing the blocks and the idea that they are composable, but it's about the idea that you can play with it and that you, you gain familiarity through the building. And the governance in many ways is not about these fixed state solid forms, but is about the, the fields of association and relationship and, and legitimacy uh, you know, in the same way as we start now thinking about electromagnetic and gravitational fields and, you know, all substance deriving out of the interconnection of those fields, thinking a little bit with that comparison to waveforms and music, we can start looking at this notion of like the differences between talking about music and listening to it and then actually playing music and jamming uh, as part of music. And so I think this broader sort of overarching way of thinking about governance, not just as the unit blocks, but also about the dynamics as to how they are used and play with, is a big part of what uh, ultimately drives, I think, a lot of us in, in, in our passion for both law, but also how it can become encoded and made more accessible and inclusive and, and available to more and more people to do more and more incredible things with. And so if we start thinking about what we might use with, uh, use composable law for, just uh, next slide, Brian, sorry. Um, this idea of um, currently this working definition, just to go back to that uh, initial piece that you were talking about, as I took this essentially from that uh, composable service uh, architecture uh, uh, line, and I've just replaced a few words, but it's a working definition. I'd love for us to sort of build this out uh, over time, but, you know, it, we're talking about a design principle essentially, rather than, you know, a set of features or a, a, a particular set of components that you can always necessarily bring in or not. It's more like a design principle or a way of looking that encourages the design of governance, these components and these dynamics in ways that can be reused in multiple solutions and that themselves can be composed as well. And I think that's a critical part is that uh, you wanna be able to make these so that they can comprise into these larger complex systems. And Brian asked the really interesting question is, you know, why would we need composable governance? And I. I, I made this analogy to architectural drawings and sort of like looking at a building. I think having composable governance as a design principle and, as, and a way of seeing is like looking at a building through the lens of the architectural drawings or via computer assisted design. Uh, it's a tool and approach for understanding uh, these dynamics, you know, by having these new lenses and these new ways of forming things together. And I think areas where this kind of approach or this lens could be well, particularly well suited are where we're coming into these more complex formations. I think where not just where we want to remove inefficiency, but for example, in the case of what Killian's talking about, where we're having these complex dynamics where data is being shared between multiple different organizations and you might want policies that flow through, you know, as part of those, not to mention bringing in, you know, data trust or sort of benevolent intermediaries that are going to help enforce some of these policies and you sort of need them as part of an ecosystem. Having this kind of composability uh, is, I think, going to be especially important in these kinds of complex uh, systems problems. And the one that I'm particularly passionate about is, is climate action and the idea of how we're going to create a global stock take when there are so many different levels at which we need to be thinking about rules and enforcement and you know, not just the provision of data, which is something that uh, the Stanford Climate Data Policy Initiative that uh, I'm a part of is, is thinking deeply about. And I'm really delighted to say that uh, SB 260 in the California Senate uh, went through uh, uh, earlier this week. And so, you know, that's another step in this sort of regulatory framework for what might look like a very, very composable governance infrastructure, because we're going to require policies, not just at the at the state level, but at the corporate level, and, and then potentially also feeding in this whole notion of nested accounting systems for auditing, you know, everybody's carbon emissions and things like that. So we've got a whole bunch of different kinds of regulatory frameworks and policies that are being brought into play around something like climate. Um, and, and the way that we as individuals and, and, and corporations are being asked to respond to that will require a much sort of more complex ability to be able to compose governance and have that governance work hand in hand with each other, have those governance APIs as it were, exactly in the way that Killian was talking about, where these legal agreements are not separate from the underlying technological API, but are really built into that. 
This has also come out a lot uh, more recently, and there's uh, there's some interesting sort of articles coming out in sort of chief information officer circles around the notion of the composable enterprise. And again, I think it's building a lot upon this idea of, you know, service oriented architecture, but what does it look like to enable the flow of data and decisions, you know, across these uh, sort of wider ecosystems of alignment that, you know, potentially include your supply chain, where you need to look back into your supply chain and determine whether, you know, everything from child labor to, you know, appropriate, uh, sort of uh, carbon accounting is being accounted for and flowed into the, the, the wider composable enterprise. That's from a regulatory perspective, but then obviously there's the business opportunities perspective where you're looking to be able to have that agility, flexibility to manage uncertainty with a sort of modular architecture with packaged business capabilities and sort of what are the ways in which you can govern those different sort of packaged modular business activities flows back to the first hour of the session around aligning BLT. Uh, the, the business, the legal and the technical layers. And so composable governance is really looking at updating and integrating uh, the capabilities of law, policy and governance into you know, the same business and technical architectures that are being developed in these more modular composable ways. So that was a sort of very, very high level sort of like, I guess, context setting for, I think some of these potential areas where this notion of composable governance might be interesting. And I think one of the most exciting areas that it's being put into play, and again, I think play is the, uh, the, the key term here, it's being used and played with, is in DAOs. Uh, these are the uh, decentralized or distributed autonomous organizations that have been built out uh, on various different blockchain protocols, but that fundamentally uh, uh, embed uh, aspects of composable governance uh, and, and might provide some lens into some of the components that we might wanna start thinking about and some of the dynamics that we might wanna start thinking about. And so this is the sort of beginning of trying to come to some form of taxonomy. Hopefully we'll end up with something as beautiful as the privacy taxonomy that Killian just showed us. But uh, for now, um, if we go on to the next slide, we can just um, just start thinking um, about, you know, what are, we, what are we talking about? So I threw this picture in here just as a, a, as a bit of a, uh, prompt for, I guess, theoretical thinking. Uh, this uh, is a reference to the uh, concept of active inference that uh, a neuroscientist, Carl Friston, has been talking about. And he talks about the, the idea of a free energy principle and the, the notion of trying to reduce surprise as part of the ways that we uh, uh, potentially dynamically organize into any kind of thing. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, making the parallel right here from what he talks about in terms of the internal states of the brain and the internal states of the world and the ways that we rely upon our sensory, our senses to, in a sense, create a Bayesian inference model of what the outside looked like. We're not necessarily directly able to discern reality, but we have a series of senses. And then we have these abilities to actuate uh, action states, as it were. And so Carl Friston talks about this in the sort of the bodily context of neuroscience. And he's also uh, uh, sort of elaborated this more as a sort of meta framework that has been picked up by machine learning uh, folks and, and you know, potentially uh, uh, given sort of some of the, the discussions I've been looking at, uh, opens up new ways of thinking about machine learning, you know, beyond uh, deep learning principles. But the reason I bring it up is that I think that uh, something that you were talking about earlier, Daza, about the idea that composable governance might enable us to sort of associate and coordinate in newer more newer ways that might be more amorphous and might actually uh, uh, create some kind of overlap between you know our affiliation with uh, you know and we see it already you know in the sense that we can be affiliated with a state as well as a, a federal uh, sort of nation state uh, and and similarly within a with an organization we can affiliate in various different ways but in thinking about the, the theoretical state and, and looking at what the different kinds of sensory apparatus of a, of a sort of composable entity might be from the corporate sense and then from the, the, the DAO sense, but you know, uh, across different collectors and then what are those action states or what are those actuators and, and thinking about how those come to define the ways that we think about what's inside and what's outside. I think it's worth sort of going right up to the very top and sort of thinking about some of these first principles. I haven't say I've fully unpacked it yet, but I kind of wanted to put this here just as a prompt as we as we go into uh, some of the 
the the aspects of DAOs. Daza, come on, jump jump in, please. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, so just to, just to seed um, thinking on what, where we're heading here is basically we're going to throw the doors wide open and ask for participation by everyone in this call and in the broader um, MIT computational law community. But one of the kind of first level questions is if, if there were to be a kind of a common way um, to um, do composable governance um, and you start looking at what would be the you know, components or modules you would snap together. Um, so one way to look at this is would, would the level of abstraction for the components be that each component would have the ability to um, uh, you know, um, uh, interact with external it, things in measure state, as well as other internal components or components inside of their components to be able to sense things and then to process and take actions? Or would this be more like a system of, would an organization have to have these functions? And then components would do like pieces and parts of this, like maybe some component does sensor, like we have an Oracle contone, component that senses states and we have, so there's like, so it's really a wide open question of how would we interpret the components and modules that would be composable, what functions and capabilities would they have? What level of abstraction? It's an open question and there's gonna be some that will work better, some that will work worse, but we wanna really know what do you think would be good? And, and what we're here, seeing here, these are stuff we know would be part of the mix, but there's not yet a point of view of how to execute upon it. So sorry, we're back to you, Tony. Um, thank you. So yeah, I, I think a lot of this is uh, invitation to, to to come and think alongside us. Uh, uh, and I will say that uh, some of the exciting aspects around how DAOs are operating in a decentralized way is providing uh, some uh, formative uh, sort of components of aspects of the sensory state mechanism. So you talked about oracles, but there's also some of the uh, prediction mechanics that go into some of the ways in which uh, th th that notion of reality is determined for the purposes of governance. And so that really is a sort of like an evolved sensory state layer uh, that maybe Silke can talk a little bit about when she when she starts talking about snapshot and its evolution into reality.east. But, um, but yeah, just here in terms of a, a sort of very high level comparison, this is taken from the Ethereum uh, Foundation website, but um, this comparison between uh, the components of a traditional organization from a composable governance perspective and what we're sort of seeing emerge in this DAO space, um, I think is premised upon some of these, these ideas of what, why DAOs are, uh, have become interesting, why people are talking about them and what, what are some of the potential ways they're currently being used and how they, how they might be used. So first off, there's this notion of sort of uh, a flat versus a hierarchical organization. And so uh, the, 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 the initial piece is not to say that DAOs might not compose into hierarchical frameworks, but that as a sort of base component, they, they tend to be uh, structured in a, in, a, in a flat initial way. And so uh, that immediately opens up the, the, the notion of what might some kind of hybrid look like? How might we potentially integrate some of the, the functionalities and benefits of how a DAO operates into sort of more traditional forms of organization. Um, secondly, there's this notion around voting. Uh, and so uh, we can dig in a little bit into some of the different ways in which uh, voting is implemented within different DAOs, but uh, essentially it's, uh, it's premised on the idea that any change needs, uh, needs and should be uh, voted upon and that those votes are transparent and can be uh, viewed by uh, pretty much anyone. And so, yeah, in the corporate sense, we've obviously got you know shareholder voting and shareholder proxy voting. Although uh, in in digging into that whole world, it's uh, it's often uh, uh, unclear to what extent shareholders are actively able to assert their their votes. You know via proxy, many brokers actually include in their terms of service that you're not allowed to sort of uh, utilize that proxy, uh, and they often just vote with management. So uh, there's a there's a piece there. There's this idea that uh, once they're tallied, that they uh, are in effect automatically uh, executed through the backbone of a DAO, which is a smart contract. And you know that smart contract is what's defining the rules of the organization. Uh, it's what's directing uh, uh, the, the rules and the logic as part of the code. Uh, and so you know, DAOs as sort of uh, examples of a computational law organization and how they've been played out, it's, it's interesting to see some of the things that they've initially focused upon. Uh, again, services uh, to, some, uh, to, to, to a large extent are handled automatically, although again, there are ways in which uh, their, they, their hybrids have developed in which you've got uh, services that are sort of like 
uh, uh, managed, uh, you know, by various different sort of freelance organizations being coordinated through a DAO. And so, you know, oftentimes, uh, obviously, the services are being delivered by uh, an organization that's connected to the DAO. But, uh, but the, this fundamental piece is the idea that <clears throat> uh, the DAO votes and, and uh, all other activities generally public and tied to your address with information about your holdings and your other on-chain activity. And so I think there's this interesting uh, discussion that we can have around sort of transparency versus privacy when it comes to sort of taking part in some of these collective uh, uh, organization forms. Um, so in looking through some of the ways that DAOs have been set up uh, and, and, and the way they've worked, uh, and some of the tooling uh, related to those. One of the discussions that Daza, uh, uh, you and I have been having and, and you know, going back a few years with, with Noah as well is, is the idea that um, there's, certain, there's certain elements that any kind of organization uh, will, will, will need to put in place. Uh, but certainly in relation to uh, the, the way that DAOs have unfolded, there's often been this initial coales coalescing around a particular objective, a particular manifesto or purpose. And you often see that sort of written out uh, amongst a particular group. And then you'll have that shared in a, in a Discord community. You'll have like the people sort of joining and communicating and sort of creating a community prior to any smart contracts being set up or formed or anything. But essentially, you know, once you've got the, the, the that ecosystem discussing and, and in place and there's there's you know, sort of various other tools from sort of discord telegram uh, element uh, that are used as part of those those discussions oftentimes um, then there's this 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 next stage which is often involved with you know, setting up your treasury uh, tools that are, uh, are often used there uh, include uh, the the I think the, the probably by uh, uh, assets held the largest tool the, the most used tool and, and silk here uh, is here as the general counsel of uh, the folks who made that tool. It's called the Gnosis Safe, uh, and it's essentially a multi-sig uh, account. Hey, Silke. Uh, uh, and when we say multi-sig, we're essentially talking about the idea that you need multiple signatories to sign off on the disbursement of funds. But that can be done, again, via your, uh, your, your, your wallet, and, uh, and it's all done on a, in a transparent way. Uh, the governance then is this sort of like much more wider piece that uh, sort of starts flowing out and you know in some ways that will have been developed as part of uh, the way that the, the community set up the, the treasury piece is a key piece of governance but um, just in terms of the historic evolution of governance in uh, in sort of DAO tooling uh, oh, in the early stages of DAOs being set up we, we often had um, a governance seeking to be embedded fully within the protocol itself and so potentially you wouldn't have a separate treasury tool it would be less composable in some sense. Uh, and you know, we, had, uh, we had platforms that many people still use, including DAOStack and Aragon, but which many people felt were potentially overly complicated. And then once you had Ethereum's price going up, it led to gas prices to passing any decision, getting to, you know, in some cases inordinately high. And so we had this evolution of governance uh, back out of the protocol itself uh, 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 in the way that these platforms had set up and into uh, certain uh, gas-free uh, sort of voting or polling mechanisms. And this includes uh, uh, things like Snapshot, although uh, there's there's certain other sort of pre-blockchain tools that have been used, including um, uh, Lumio and CoBudget that allow for certain uh, off-chain decisions to be made and then tied into uh, separately a, a multi-sig transaction. Uh, and then uh, the, the, the problem with that though is that once you've got somebody in the loop with actually taking the, the results of a poll and then sort of putting it through the, the, the treasury or the, the multi-sig, uh, you've got one, a point of failure and a point of potential corruption, which is what DAOs are really trying to remove. And then you've also got the potential liability that goes with those actions being identified with those signers rather than with the, the DAO itself. And so uh, Silke, again, was you know, critical to actually figuring this out on, in a live basis for you know, a series of DAOs. But, and that led to SafeSnap which was a sort of like polling mechanism, sort of getting tied directly into the Gnosis safe. Uh, and so uh, again, we're, we're sort of part of the evolution of the tooling here. And uh, I'm very curious to see how Noah has been thinking about and working on governance as part of what he's been doing. Uh, but the, the real piece that, uh, that I know Noah has been thinking a lot about is around the, the ownership and the, the management of those sort of components of ownership that exist within the blockchain and DAO space, and namely tokens. Right, so you have fungible tokens, you've got this phenomenon of governance tokens, and then you've got this 
new phenomenon again of non-fungible tokens. Each of those uh, tokens, uh, maybe we can sort of jam about a little bit more with, with Noah and Brian, because they've been working deeply as, as part of this, uh, as part of Upside. But uh, each of those, I in a sense, probably allows- mention, Sorry to interrupt, but uh, like speaking of Noah and, uh, and Brian, like we do have to make some room for them. And I, I, we obviously should have made three hours just on this session, because you're you're providing a master <laughs> class on this. So I, it pains me to, to prompt you along, but but um, but I'm doing it anyway. Yeah, so maybe I can just like uh, jump directly ahead just to my last slide. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to bring it up. Uh, no, so just back to the, the meme, actually, the rage quit meme. Um, so this is something that I just wanted to seed in here as an example of the kind of governance mechanism that uh, you might want to start composing, but it's certainly been a key part of the sort of like the DAO ecosystem. Uh, this is essentially the ability to, to leave. Uh, and, you know, it'd be, it's interesting, I think, to compare Rez as an opponent and to what extent it exists, you know, in our current uh, sort of uh, traditional organizational models. Uh, but with that, I'll, I'll I'll leave it there, and let's like sort of dive into some of the uh, the stuff that uh, Noah and Ryan uh, Noah and Brian have to to share with us. Th thank you so much, Tony. Much more to say, and uh, uh, it just as a, a little spoiler, uh, the last Friday of the month um, in February, uh, which will be the twenty fifth uh, at twelve p.m. Eastern, we're going to be doing the next idea flow session and um I, I would you know I it really pains me to have um to have cut you off before you were you were quite done. If you're around um that one or or one of the subsequent ones, let's pick this conversation right back up where we inter interrupted you at that point and let, let people join in. Okay. Great. So with that um uh, our next speaker is Noah Noah uh, are you on are you with us? Yep. Yeah. Yep I'm here uh Am I uh, visible? I'm going to go let you go into share screen, Noah. Oh, great. Perfect. Um, yeah, well, I'll just say a few things uh, before I jump into the, the share screen. It's lovely to be here. Uh, this has been a, a many year conversation, and um, it, it's really exciting to see a lot of the projects that have been going on for, for many, many years, like finally in, in major use this year. Um, and uh, so I'm going to kind of jump into this presentation here. I'll try to be mindful of the time so that we have room for everybody. Um, so uh, I, I've been, uh, uh, many of you may know that I worked on a, a project called Comakery for many years, which was kind of gathering people together around projects. Uh, we repositioned that infrastructure into something called Upside. And I think it fits in pretty well uh, with, uh, with the topic here about composable governance. Gonna start with where we are. Um, and then I'm in, in terms of the, the community as a whole and sort of some of the drivers uh, that we're seeing moving around. And then I'll talk about some, uh, some specifics of how we're doing composable governance and how we're thinking about it. Um, so just to drive, dive right in, this is astounding to me. There's 20,000 new tokens that are created every month on Ethereum and growing. Actually, the NFTs, even though they're like taking up a lot of the the, uh, the meme space are only a very small portion of this. This is December of 2021. Um, so this is this is pretty crazy. Um, and I think one of the reasons why DAO governance has become such a huge topic this year is because the market capitalization of uh, decentralized governance tokens is pretty huge. And a lot of that has to do with regulatory situation, which maybe I'll talk about at the end. Um, but this huge increase in value has been, uh, has been, has really brought attention to a lot of the experiments that have been going on in the community for many years. And in some, in some ways, the DAO uh, community has uh, not gotten as much attention as some of the other things happening in the space. So it's really exciting that this is driving that. Um, if you haven't seen Deep DAO, I really recommend checking it out. This is, um, uh, I'm not affiliated with them in any way, but like, I love that this exists. Um, it shows how much treasury there are. Like, it's amazing. There's 406,000 active voters and proposal makers right now. It just really shows how far this industry um, and uh, community have come. So check this out. Um, I'm going to dive straight into some of the things that we're working on in our uh, private beta right now at Upside. Um, and this is kind of the framework that I, I want to share, uh, which is around DAO building blocks. So um, broadly speaking, governance uh, can be about shaping the decisions within the community or around the, the interactions and relationships that people have. I think there's a set of mm, individual building blocks that make building DAOs different than uh, building, a, say, a traditional organization or, uh, or a company. 
And uh, these are the ones that we're looking at specifically uh, at Upside. There's token transfer restrictions um, known as ERC-1404 or 14. Uh, there's some other ones. Uh, so there's a token transfer restrictions useful for security tokens. There's NFTs and their metadata. Metadata is this huge topic. Um, there's just basic tokens, ERC-20s. There's DAO voting, uh, which is also a huge topic. On-chain vesting uh, or streams of tokens that are issued over time. The token gated content, I think, comes into play a lot more uh, in the, the token space than like a long time ago, if you had shares, you would get a discount at a store uh, and or you would get access to certain events. That's really become very prominent in the uh, in the in this uh, token based community building dividend distribution oracles uh, that uh, feed information back into smart contract arrangements or another component staking rewards um, and swap contracts. There's other components, but these are the ones that I think are um, really in common use uh, across a lot of different organizations. And what interests me most right now um, is how these things are going to be combined into different kinds of organizations. And there's four on the left that I think are kind of like common use cases. There's the company or fund, which ends up having transfer restrictions. There's the unregulated, unregulated DAO, which is unrestricted. Um, but has does have the voting and uh, may have other things like on-chain vesting. There's unregulated NFTs, and you're not really seeing regulated NFTs so much right now, but you should expect to see those uh, sometime soon. So we're going to keep going. Um, so this is a uh, sort of prototype. Uh, this will be much more beautiful when it's actually launched, but uh, the idea is how do you launch something that composes all of these things in a very short period of time? So we're building a launcher for that. Uh, select your blockchain. Um, and then uh, putting your token details, because usually the basis of all these systems is a token. So the name, the symbol, um, who receives the initial supply. Often this will be a Gnosis safe <laughs> that will be receiving a large portion of the initial treasury. Um, and then token power-ups. This is kind of where this, uh, this idea of those uh, building blocks starts to get more interesting, where if you want to add some kind of staking yield, uh, governance voting built into the token, is this a transfer restricted token or a security token? And then uh, go ahead and deploy it, goes out to the blockchain, and then you end up in, in admin uh, panels for administrating this. Uh, and uh, so some of the things that we're, we're finding are really um, are, are of great interest are uh, things like vesting schedules. So this is the vesting schedule module. Um, this one is like a one-year uh, vest uh, and then vesting daily for four years. Um, you can actually do things that you wouldn't do in traditional vesting. It's like you can do per second vesting, which ultimately ends up being per block vesting. Um, but you can kind of stream vesting tokens. Um, I think this component actually is going to become very important to the evolution of DAOs. Because right now we're thinking of like bounties or, uh, or proposals, but we don't yet have this idea of uh, widely adopted value streams. I think this is an area of growth. Uh, proposal voting for stake tokens. Um, this is something we're building out. You'll notice this one's on uh, Solana rather than on Ethereum, but um, the uh, this uh, people have seen a lot of voting stuff and I'm sure we'll talk about it more with Snapshot. Um, and then I would say one of the biggest choices that we're seeing in the space is around whether something is a security token or whether it's a governance token. And broadly speaking, security tokens are going to have dividends that could be backed by off-chain assets. There's some kind of investment contract. Um, it's only available to restricted or high net worth investors, typically highly regulated. Whereas the, a lot of the growth for governance tokens has been around that it separates the underlying value uh, or the, the off-chain asset from just the right to vote. And that is what has moved these tokens into an unregulated space. And that's why we're seeing um, so much experiment experimentation and growth in that space. Um, they're, they're not typically associated with an underlying value, although they might direct some value towards proposals. Um, and they're freely transferable and there's high accessibility. Um, we do have an, a transfer restriction module, which is more for security tokens. And the, uh, in this case, you might want to do something like um, you have uh, you you're sold the token, a security token, to a Reg D investor, and then um, the uh, Reg D investors are not allowed to sell to each other for one year. They can sell to Reg S investors who are offshore, and those investors can transfer to the exchange with each other. So this basically is like a construction kit for. Uh, modifying the transfer restriction graph 
And then once the issuer decides on that graph, then the interactions with that are approved. So right now, the idea is around single token systems with transfer restrictions. But the growth area, the exciting and interesting area, I think, is around these transfer graphs that interact with each other, possibly modulated with like an exchange rate driven by an oracle. So that you have this like more complex system about how maybe access tokens and investment tokens can interact to build these more complex systems. So that's sort of something I see coming in the future. Um, this is like a, a visual view of uh, a kind of graph that can be generated from those nodes and edges. Um, yeah, so a couple of conjectures about the future, and this is where I'll, I'll leave it. Um, uh, I think that, um, as we mentioned earlier, I think that DAOs will vote to elect token stream payments in the future for fulfillments of service roles. So right now we have these flat organizations, um, I think uh, that are, and that's what we think of as DAOs, but I actually think that DAOs are gonna evolve to elect roles similar to say some of the holacracy or ad hocracy um, kind of structures that people were experimenting with about five or six years ago. And I think that those are actually going to come to DAO as we're going to actually build more complex organizations than we have right now. We have the kernel of like capital allocation through voting, but I think that that's going to get more complex would be interesting. Um, I think oracles are going to be streaming a lot more data that will maybe modulate those payments or based on outcomes. So you'll be able to uh, sort of modulate the compensation or exchange rates between different tokens. That's going to be exciting. Um, I really believe that like there's going to be an algorithm for that limits the power of token weighted voting for large token holders. I, I nicknamed this uh, whale dampening. Um, and I think it actually is going to have a huge impact on what uh, our broad scale, what capitalism means, because as the shareholder votes get modulated, the larger sort of token holders would not have as much impact and there'd be more community management, but there's yet there'd still be sort of the profit interest. Um, so that, that's going to be interesting. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more innovation in the unregulated spaces as we've seen, um, and that that includes both uh, the governance token area, assuming that remains uh, somewhat unregulated, but it also means games. So I think the future of work is being modeled, modulated. Uh, this being the future of work is being experimented with in the gaming community, where the risks are lower, and that we we really we should be paying attention to the play spaces more. Um, so that'll be exciting. I also think, contrary to popular belief, that full decentralization is actually a competitive advantage because when things become fully decentralized, they actually are less regulated. And I think people have vastly uh, underappreciated this fact. Um, and also that this, um, the other thing to watch in these in, in, in the blockchain space is how fast are people making decisions about real assets? So there has been some discussion about how like, oh, this could just be done in a database. And most people are not looking at the legal clearing side of, of the financial instruments that are in play. So like, sh sure, you can change something in a database, but like, you know, your clearance time is still like T plus three. You don't really know what's happening with like naked short selling, all these other things that are happening on the database level. <laughs> so, um, so I think there are competitive advantages to decentralization. And, and yet, I think there's a lot of a uh, uh, real world value um, that must be represented within a securities framework and that um, that will benefit from a lot of the innovation that's happening in, in other less regulated areas. So I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Noah. Um, wow, so much depth and that that um, chart was particularly helpful to uh, to um, kind of put get, get some traction on what can otherwise be you know very conceptual. And that's a perfect bridge, I might add, to to uh, to the next um, speaker, uh, uh, Brian, uh, who's going to talk a little more from a design approach about composable governance. And then I'm going to introduce um, Megan, who's going to um, who's going to basically um, give us an opportunity to play together more directly on um, uh, on this topic. So with that, uh, Brian, I know you've got a couple of slides. Uh, could you uh, could you take it away? Yeah, just one moment. Um, uh, and gotta... Brian yeah. is the editor in chief of law.mit.edu's MIT Computational Law Report, by the way. And it was um, his leadership uh, that where he prompted us to actually try to tackle composable governance this year. Ah, here we go. All right, take it away. Yeah, so kind of quickly connecting the dots with some of what we've all been talking about today, whether 
it's from the composability aspect or the play aspect or the harmonization of the, the BLT or, you know, the actual creation of these new types of modules for how we can do some of this stuff. Um, you know, one of the big underlying themes here is what design patterns can we adopt to go from a paper centric paradigm of law to one that sees law more like data and more composable. For me, the biggest entryway to some of these notions around engineering, composability, and complex systems has been the work of Buckminster Fuller. Buckminster Fuller, for those of you who don't know, is famous for populating the architecture of the geodesic dome. Um, and critically, you know, some of his ideas really serve as the foundation for a lot of these interoperable complex systems that are based on parametric definitions that can be used to compose an architecture um, based on different limitations, like what type of uh, what type of material you have, how big of a space do you have, um, you know, anything that's really related to a given environment. And I think that's what we're now coming uh, up to the potential of with law. So now we have the opportunity to actually compose law in the same way that we compose architecture through CAD and these other systems. So bringing this into squarely into the legal context, there are already a couple examples to help demonstrate how some of this works. Um, the Creative Commons license framework is a notable first example here for a few different reasons. First, the framework can be mapped using an expert system. This means that any of these answers that you select um, from the Creative Commons license selector give you different rights. Um, so this is selected as the Creative Commons uh, 4.0 share alike, uh, or no, 4.0 international license, it's yes and yes. Um, and, not, and, and, and that's important because, you know, prior to the systemization of legal rules and processes, it was, it was kind of a one-off, you create a legal instrument and you spend a lot of time creating it. Now, if we create a system where you answer a few questions, it quickly spits it out. Um, the second reason I think that this is important is because the framework's modular. Um, and that, that goes not only to this ability to be part of an expert system, but it also goes into tying the, the legal aspect of the, uh, of the code that gets spit out here to actual software code and also plain language summaries of what all of these obligations mean. And then finally, I think this uh, helps show a, path, a harmonized path forward to prevent gaps between law, code, and accessibility and some of the ways like Killian was talking about. So here's what one of those answers kind of looks like when you break it down and examine it more thoroughly. Um, and and you can see here, the, the plain language summaries shows you what you can and can't do. Um, there's this legal text blurb, which you know spits out like an actual license like you might see in intellectual property law. Um, and then you can embed this code in your website and um, people querying it can automatically kind of see what they can and can't do with your material. The, the kind of bonus point here is that there's also a, uh, an icon that you can use to sort of visually and quickly distinguish what this what set of rights you you have and you get to play around with, and I think that gets us. Uh, we've got a little, little bit of time for discussion, so I don't know if we want to do discussion before doing the uh, the cool next part. Um, uh, my suggestion. So that was awesome, first of all, Brian. And my suggestion is, um, I think um, we should have Megan um, jump right in and let's do the announcement and then that can help seed the discussion because people may have, it may just well spark some ideas which not coincidentally is part of the idea for the announcement so uh megan do, do you have the uh here we go uh i see it here um take uh, take it away oh and i should uh, i should say uh megan is our um managing editor for the mit computational law report and i want to say one other thing which is we are now entering a new hat segment this is now law.mit.edu uberalis. And furthermore, it's a new jacket segment. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna get a little bit more colorful. We're gonna get a little bit more creative. Now it's time for that play box you've all been asking for. All right, take it away. Hi everyone, so it's nice to see everyone here and I'm sure that after such incredible sessions, you're all probably overflowing with creativity um, and we're super happy that this has sparked interest. So on that note, our call for action from this workshop is to ask you if you'd like to join this playground. 
um, and we're doing a call for submissions in what we call an open access publication, um, somewhat of like an open book or an anthology of sorts. Uh, we call it the Collected Works on Composable Governance. And the reason why we decide to use the term Collected Works is really because we try to make it as diverse and open as possible. We're trying to range from conceptual works to a little bit more practical, trying to understand how you would implement or conceptualize implementing um, composable governance, as well as really going down to the weeds and getting a technical documentation or technical description um, and pro probably proposing some um, functional modules or legal components that you'd like to see or have developed. So um, we also make it open in terms of formatting as well as um, uh, formatting and the length, just so that, you know, whatever you would like to offer us, we would like to see. Um, so I think Daza has dropped in the link uh, where you could um, submit your, uh, submit whatever you'd like to offer us. And uh, we have the link as uh, to the form, as well as important dates um, and timelines, just so that you know kind of the schedule and expected schedule for all of these details. So we hope that uh, this is exciting for you all um, and that we're really looking forward to what kind of you got out from this. Um, just as a small anecdote, about two years ago, I attended the IAP. Um, and I had written a piece from it and it really took me into this computational law world. So thanks again to Brian and Daza for that. And so I kind of see this as an important call to action for anyone who really wants to dive further and dive deeper into um, not only computational law and exploring this space, but also composable governance. So yeah, take it away Daza and Brian. Um, if Thank you, you like. so much. And just to pick up on that last point, um, when um, uh, Megan um, came to the class, uh, we, we really didn't know you at all. You just kind of um, saw something announced, you clicked on the link, participated like a champion, then submitted something to, to the call of action for that year. It was so great. We You presented it um, uh, on live online, and then we kept uh, publishing your stuff. And next thing you know, you're volunteering, and next thing you know, you're managing editor uh, of the Computational Law Report and just a cherished um, critical uh, collaborator, member of the MIT Computational Law community. So um, everybody, be like Megan <laughs> and go ahead and take us up on this invitation to think up and then share your ideas and uh, let us help catalyze the, the idea flow and see if we can't come up with something that could actually legitimately be composable governance. So uh, with that, uh, uh, Brian and Tony, uh, I invite you to sort of facilitate uh, the discussion period uh, that we have now on these topics. Sure. Fantastic. So uh, please feel free to throw questions and thoughts into the chat. But first off, uh, I wanted to throw it over to Isaac, uh, who I invited here to talk about uh, some of what he's been up to. Uh, he's been working on a, a sort of deeply in a whole bunch of DAOs uh and has has a sort of like a deep hacker uh, mindset and experience uh which we love here fantastic hey my isaac uh thanks for joining so um, yeah, yeah thanks for the invite. Uh, you've been you've been working in, in particular upon a new um uh standard for uh sort of querying governance issues and and relevant data from DAOs. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that and how uh, if at all you you see it sort of fitting into some of what we've been talking about um, sure. Yeah, um, we've been working in this uh, in this like kind of meta governance uh, uh, DAO research group, just trying to agree on kind of like what the fundamental primitives are in DAO taxonomy land that we can use to extend um, to different DAO frameworks. Because uh, we all have kind of seen since since like the Gnosis um, like Zodiac uh, announcement earlier in the year, um, it, people are thinking more a lot more about just like how do you compose these different structures where you like keep maybe a single avatar, which is DAO's treasury, but basically plug in different modules over time. And how do you allow DAO to describe what its rules are and describe what its, what its constitution is, um, describe how it, even, how it even thinks about membership um, in a way that allows it to evolve and grow as the community changes. Um, because something that we often see is that like a DAO spins up as um, a multi-sig with two or three people. 
and with uh, with like Zodiac, and which is kind of the same thing that Reality.eth and SafeSnap uses, it basically allows the multi-sig signers to remove themselves and plug it into something else. Um, and so since these things update over time, we also need to allow uh, DAOs to update how they describe themselves over time. Um, so I'll give a, a I'll just uh, share quickly this uh, draft that um, that we are. Let's see. Let me share just that window. Um, this draft on what we're uh, what we're using to help DAOs describe themselves, uh, because what we don't want to do here is impose a standard on uh, how DAOs should govern and how DAOs should do anything, basically. Because there's just it's kind of an endless creativity period where people are um, thinking of all sorts of different modules to create. Um, so instead, what we want to do is just allow DAOs to say. This is what we think we do. This is how we describe people that are part of us. Um, this is how we're describing state changes to our community um, and the transitions between those. Um, so uh, the um, the core of this EIP is this concept of a DAO URI um, in the NFT. Yep, uh, this NFT this page is open. Let me share the link. Um, the thing about URIs uh, in in the DAO land, I, I kind of think of it like uh, in relation to the NFT world. Um, to me, like the most one of the most powerful things about the NFT space is not so much like the digital asset ownership, but it's the fact that people have agreed on a standard taxonomy and a standard way of querying data. You can technically make any smart contract look like an NFT. It doesn't have to be an NFT, but you can basically say you can basically have some JSON that describes a some sort of asset, and now everything that works with uh, with NFTs knows how to interpret what your what your contract has. And so we want to bring this to DAOs where we can just say. All right, do whatever you want as a DAO. Just give us some information about um, if I were to go into Etherscan or DeepDAO and, and click on your DAO's address, um, can you link me to a constitution that's like, what do we believe in? Can you link me to a member's URI, which maybe is a static JSON file, which is like, these are our members, or maybe it links to a subgraph, which tells you how to get our the freshest look at our members. Um, can you link us to a proposals URI, which just says this, these are the upcoming potential changes to our DAO, and these are the potential ways that they could change. Um, in addition, we're, we're looking at different, uh, for the actual management of the taxonomy, um, before DAOs, I was in, uh, doing more stuff in like the decentralized identity uh, verifiable credentials uh, space. And something that I thought was really powerful there was the, the use of JSON-LD, where we can just define these really basic root types about um, a member is doesn't even have to be an Ethereum address. A member can just be um, some concept of a unique ID, and that can be extended to be a DID, an Ethereum address, a multi-chain address. Um, and then over time, basically DAOs can say, I am this, plus I believe in these things. Um, and so that we can build this like tree of, uh, of, of what DAOs are doing. Um, so yeah, there's just a, a quick intro yeah. to like what we're, what we're thinking. And, and that last piece I think is super important for some of these notions of how it's going to integrate in with like some of the stuff we heard about earlier in the workshop uh, with the, the Open ID Federation, because I think some of these standards uh, are, are, are based upon, you know, the same sort of uh, identity federation mechanics. So that's yeah. super, super exciting. Thank you so much, Isaac. Um, sure. Silke, we, we're going to sort of uh, see if you've got uh, a moment to come and talk to us a little bit about Gnosis tools and privacy. So we've heard a uh, discussion about Gnosis Safe, uh, which is the sort of the largest uh, or the most used uh, of these multi-sig accounts, but there's a whole bunch of different things as the general counsel of Gnosis that you've been having to deal with. So thank you so much for being here with us. And uh, yeah, we'd love you to share what you have. Hi guys. Um, so Isaac has already spoken a bit about no safe, and he, they're building on top of this. But originally, just to to, to step go one step back, I mean, most people probably here know the most safe, but what it is, is basically a multi-signature wallet, um, which we built in 2017 to store our own funds after the ICO. And then it, it took off, off, people thought it was really useful. And what we noticed in 2019 is that, in fact, you could very much, people, when they spoke about DAOs, what they actually often mean is, a multi-signature wallet. And the Gnosis Safe is a very, very much used um, multi-signature wallet. It stores around 3% of all Ethereum on it at the moment. And after what uh, Tony already said was that um, the, the tools that were built for DAOs, especially Aragon, the early ones, and starting 2017-18, mainly when the 19 user became new usable, that uh, because of the gas price, people actually stopped using uh, those um, uh, DAO platforms, which have really great 
and still do have really great ways for DAOs actually to live entirely on chain. So people went back to the uh, Gnosis Safe, um, um, which is basically allows you to add as many owners as you want. And I'm not sure whether I can do this live, but maybe I should just share my screen and I can show you how Gnosis Safe actually looks like. Um, let me just... <laughs> Um, sorry, I'm really bad with this, but let me just one sec. Give me one moment. Where is it? So go back. Normally I would, I would, I am. So, um, can you all see that? So this is basically the interface of a nurse's safe. Um, the, yep, the, okay. there also, there's also a mobile app, but this is, I just used this as an example. Now, usually I have many more assets. This, this one is actually empty, but what it is, it's a smart contract wallet and uh, you have several owners which uh, control the wallet. And what you can do, and I'm just going to show you this, um, is that, this safe I just loaded here, you see that there are eight, P, eight uh, wallet addresses that control it. And the policies in, you see that four, you need four signatures to actually do anything in this safe. So uh, DAOs, especially some of the very, very big ones, they use this, um, they form this council. Um, what has happened is actually, yes, people want to all vote on and they want that there's very, very much, what Tony said, direct democracy in a way to, to vote on, but in fact, it's not very agile. So uh, for example, Yearn Finance, many went back and said, okay, we're going to have the eight people who are um, going to decide the things or like to execute the stuff the DAO decides. And because of the gas prices, people moved to snapshot um, because it was gasless voting. And DAOs were constituted by basically having a treasury with a nose safe with some trusted community members being the signers here, as you see here. And you would have snapshot where basically all the voting is done, which was built by Balancer Labs. Um, but there wouldn't be a con connection. And then um, now you see more and more, and of course also Gnosis um, modules that connect the uh, gasless voting on snapshot with the Gnosis safe. So um, for the Gnosis DAO, which um, we form, we announced more than a year ago, but then it took quite a lot of legal structuring to actually move the funds of a prof for profit entity into an unregistered DAO. We then requested, oh, actually, we need a self execution mechanism. So we need to have um, the snapshot voting be on chain executed and then on the safe. Um, so out of that, a Zodiac um, came about, or this is actually my story for it, um, which is one of the Gnosis teams. And these are the apps you can all use from your Gnosis. So it's in a way like a small bank. It's like an operating system for DAOs. This is how we see it. And there you have the expansion pack. And so the self-execution, you can basically block it in and use like the reality uh, module Sorry, it's not loading, unfortunately. Oh, My, um, not, not to worry. Uh, I'm going to just take one, one quick program note while it's loading. It's perfect timing, actually. Uh, so those <laughs> of you that so that concludes the formal session for the 2022 MIT Computational Law Workshop. Um, thank you very much for, for joining us. And we're going to keep the line open because clearly there's a lot more to talk about, including just finishing the remarks that we're in the middle of. But there's also yeah. some other remarks. Um, that are um, that are that I think people are interested in. So if you're available and interested, stay on the line with us. If it's time for you to go, you, you've got the the meat and potatoes of it, and follow up if you want to keep the conversation alive by making your contribution to the next um, publication that we're doing on composable governance at law.mit.edu forward slash composable governance, one word. So with that, I want to thank all the speakers and all the participants um, for joining us dot, 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 and we're in extra innings. Back to you. You were just taking us into the safe. No, actually, I'll just need more two more minutes. So what you see yep. now here is the Zodiac tools for, uh, for DAO governance, which you can all plug in as you want. It's very modular. It's composable, as we were just talking about co composable governance. So the reality module, um, from a legal perspective, a lot of people forget that actually DAOs are still subject to the law, and there is still a lot of um, 
it, it's, it doesn't work yet fully. Um, but basically what it, well, you have different modules, one of them, and I think this is the most important one is the self-execution one, is the reality one here. Um, I wanted to say something about privacy. Obviously in a DAO space, nothing is private. So when you use um, for your company operation, the nose is safe, everyone sees everything all the time. And what a lot of people often forget is also you see the owners, you know, what wallet addresses um, to um, control it. As to privacy, I think we haven't really built those tools yet. So the, um, and this is one of my actually hard the things I really want to have us process. Everyone always focuses on transparency with DAOs. It's one of the big um, advantages, but it's also a drawback because for example, give a DAO legal advice. You're going to write everything in the, in the transparently in, you know, the forum, like a snapshot, my proposal in discourse, what they use. Um, for some things, you might actually want to have dark DAOs, and I mean it in a good way, like anon DAOs, or at least shielded DAOs, where the vote voting of the DAO is shielded because of the potential liabilities people might have. Um, there are a few projects that actually started to work on this. I recently saw the launch DAO by Panther. I'm, I'm not connected to them, but I basically realized that they decided to uh, launch or, or have a token generation event. And the people who voted on it, you knew that people voted and what percentage voted, but you don't really know which address voted. Um, for what and which addresses were actually in it. While everyone was KYC from the token sale, these people had this chance to vote. So I think um, in terms of privacy, DAOs are, because they're so transparent, um, they are actually right now not very good. And we do need more tools that can be plugged in for certain situation. For example, the DAO wants legal advice, because they, their IP rights are infringed. You want, might not necessarily want this all to be public, what you're going to do. Some people, this is very controversial view on like whether this is any good or not. I think we need those tools and I would be really interested to have to jam with people on like how these tools could be built without infringing up, upon the advantages of all the uh, transparency that was actually bring. That's it. Uh, thank you so much. I, I, if Tony, if you and Brian, if uh, if I may, and then we throw it open. I just have one burning thing that I don't want to forget. Is partly, but I feel like this was such a great. First of all, thank you for showing us um, that tooling, and but on that last question about, well, almost like a private, privileged um, space that's nonetheless within a DAO, um, and 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 the implications of that, and and the fact that it's controversial, I think is such a terrific topic for this question of governance because i mean would one way to look at this be as a governance question for a given community would they say almost constitutionally that this is a DAO where everything we're doing is transparent or might they have a different context instead of objectives that they declare for themselves that this is a DAO where some things we're doing um, uh, are going to support privacy or even confidentiality for um, legal advice um, i mean in other words could this in fact be a governance question that doesn't need to have one answer for everyone? Just throwing it out there. And since you're not answering, I guess we'll, we'll say, I'm gonna just say, hey, everybody, I think this could be a governance question itself. And this could be a good example of that, uh, but you know, Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, may, maybe there's supposed to be a uniform, universal, eternal definition of DAOs that never allows or or uh, allows for this. So uh, you know, we'll we'll let the debate unfold. And uh, back to you, Tony and and Brian, to facilitate the remainder of this uh, informal discussion session. I mean, just first thoughts on what you said, Dazza, and sort of taking a cue from what Silky uh, put in the chat. It's it is these are all open questions, and it's. It leads to a lot of lawyers being reluctant to advise DAOs due to these these kinds of uh, liability issues, uh, this lack of certainty over who the client is. Uh, certainly, there's lawyers who are sort of like taking the position that they're sort of putting uh, things out sort of into the open, and they're not necessarily advising any particular person, but they 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 may have been funded to do work that is then open sourced and can be uh, applied by anyone. But I think there is, in some sense, space for. What you're talking about in terms of a, a some sort of composable privacy layer 
that nevertheless uh, is accessible with certain kinds of uh, attributes that you may have within the DAO. And, you know, you can imagine there being uh, uh, that still being sort of open to anybody within the DAO subject to sort of meeting certain criteria, but that still doesn't prevent you from having certain kind of um, private spaces for, for, for less than fully open uh, communications. Yeah, and and kind of building building there on something that I think could be really interesting and going back to the notion of a lot of this space being a play uh, a, a space to play in. Um, you know, four four years ago, uh in the IAP course, we you know, we were really interested in in crypto kitties as almost like the model for, you know, what are NFTs able to do. How can they operate in this kind of open and public constellation of apps and services that allow you to do different and kind of interesting things? And I think, you know, we've sort of played around enough with that to go from, you know, something that was very much a play thing to something that turned into NBA Top Shot, the NFT kind of uh, collectible thing. And now we're seeing the rise of NFT credentials. And so, you know, what I would be interested in and maybe this is kind of like a, almost like a moot court style idea, but, but having a series of challenges and, and like a DAO Olympics, like the Olympics for DAOs, where you set up a number of different, you know, almost like uh, disciplines, like trying to accomplish different tasks and you have different DAO configurations and people playing around with those in order to try and figure out how to accomplish some goal or what the, uh, even what the trade-offs are from trying to do it one way or another. Um, I think having that space to play is very much what we envisioned when we wanted to make this call for submissions um, for collect, uh, collected works on composable governance, because you know it's very much in an uh, embryonic stage and it would be really worthwhile to figure out you know, how we can play with all this stuff together in a, in a way that does you know, it may seem silly at the time, but it does provide value long into the future that people can learn from in the same way that has happened with previous crypto innovations. Um, and, and yeah, I, that makes me excited. So. Sukha, so, you came back on your video. Have, have you got something you wanted to share about your thoughts? No, I just, I, I, I love the DAO Olympics um, idea, and we should have different tracks, you know, um, different. Um, yeah, track you know, and field. One, track and field. <laughs> I mean, like hurdles, like privacy, then I don't know, um, um, spare, um, you know, uh, just some others, jump, high jump, or, or something else. I, I, I do actually like that idea. So, um, and, and, and I mean, you know, we're building so many things right now and um, a lot of the governance things had actually looked at in the past. So we should not reinvent the wheel on some of the things. Um, and, but uh, I, I, I think there are just uh, so many issues also with the direct democracy ideas, which um, a lot of the DAOs now start, start delegating. You know, I have the ENS DAO and um, Gitcoin that, have very wonderful schemes which um, and different voting mechanisms which you can use now also even in snapshot already so yeah i'd love it well oh and i love this comment from noah yes but um about the, the merkel drop contracts yeah, yeah, yeah let's check that out yeah, we should look at that. But thanks so much, everyone. I loved it. Yeah. So we it just um, like team, we should we should look at um, maybe adjusting or extending slightly the the uh, call for participation for composable governance to include like a DAO Olympics. And I think that fits yeah. neatly in at least two of the tracks, tracks two and three, which are fairly practical. So it's uh, I think we could do that. Yeah. I see people saying sense. Um, Oh, um, okay. I would also, can I also, I would also, what, what I would find really important in the Olympics is the, the impact DAO Olymp, um, par, um, track, maybe, because um, at the moment I find those 
some of the most interesting ones. Of course, for profits also good, but yeah, like you know, for justice, even a, a free Ross DAO, and now the free Assange DAO. So you have very good examples of trying to um, impact the legal system via DAOs. Yeah, indeed, that's so interesting. And you know, earlier this or uh, last year, we had uh, Diana Stern uh, as one of the speakers in. Uh, the idea flow monthly session and one of the things she showed us how to do was integrate um, legal license terms with nfts based on a kind of a cool legal hack um, and but interestingly what we did was we chose a creative commons license so we're sort of doing a hack upon a hack so that's a that's a kind of free um, license type uh, which assumes that there's not royalties coming in um, and it's a different mentality and it may be the type of um, configuration one could one should be able to set with a mission-driven, maybe nonprofit-oriented DAO that's um, that's not uh, the for-profit type. You know, some of that would play out with um, uh, like a selector for license types, as well as so many other things. Um, very, very interesting. So we that could be a track. You know, kind of like a, you know, you run on this field if it's for profit, and the main measurement of performance and success, I think, includes revenue generation and profit. But maybe there's other metrics for success for composable governance in the impact and not, not for profit and mission driven uh, categories as well. Like Tony what was on another idea flow where we looked very deeply at um, carbon accounting and um, and those kinds of ESGs and how to measure that. So yeah, and I, very, think very, I, I was just quickly, I think that's one of the especially exciting things about these organizations that create value based on inputs from data, because if you turn that input um, into something like climate data, you can bias the transactions of an organization in favor of a set of outcomes and begin to programmatically achieve those goals. So whether it's, um, you know, climate and sustainability oriented or whether it's related to affordable housing or whether it's related to public infrastructure, you can, you know, create, uh, create a mission that is related specifically to, you know, different data outcomes and if the organization kind of functions as it should then you know those those are the types of things that should sort of be figured out and that's that's not really even you know that new of an idea there's a there's a european economist bernard leiter leiter i don't know how to pronounce his name correctly but he uh he's one of the guys that um helped design the euro and one of the things that he was looking at is how can we, you know, create the euro as a basket of, as almost like backed by a basket of commodities, but also services so that it's, you know, regenerating the forests and it's promoting commerce through toll roads. And it's also backed by, you know, things like gold. And, and so I think there, there are interesting um, overlaps with uh, analog incumbent industries that we can draw from, but also extend um, with this ability to represent things and engineer things as uh, as as law. Here, here. Okay, so so as we start to wrap up, I was just, you're you're actually right on point, uh, Tony. I was going to say let, let, let's go through and have everyone that spoke on this session kind of make your final remarks. And not coincidentally, the first one is Tony. Well, thanks. I um, I'm deeply appreciative of everything uh, our crew is doing uh, in this area and yeah I love that we can continue engaging in this with a spirit of full-on jam uh, and hopefully uh, uh, others who are connecting with this will uh, join us for future jams but uh, deeply appreciative thank you Daza thank you Brian uh, thank you Megan Noah uh, Silke and Isaac as well just a, a big a huge thanks to everything that you guys are doing in the ecosystem as well and uh, yeah let's take this forward for, for maximum impact. You're here. Thank you, Tony. And um, Noah. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, it, do you have it, so? If do you have any final remarks, or do you want to pass the baton? No, oh, I'll, I'll pass the baton. This is a wonderful session, uh, and you have a wonderful jacket. And uh, yeah, really great to be here. <laughs> Thank you, Noah. Um, uh, Brian. Yeah, I, I'll just say, uh, you know, kind of, I've, I've got kind of like a dual, dual thank you or a pluralistic thank you, because I, I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful to 
you know, have a chance to put on things like this that people get really interested in and excited about. Um, but also, you know, very grateful for even this being my sixth IAP workshop to participate in. So, um, you know, this is, uh, this is really fun. And I think by, you know, getting everybody excited about these types of things and by uh, exploring with kind of an intellectual uh, vigor, um, you know, how these things might play out, um, we're, we're helping co-create the future together. And so I just want to say thank you to, you know, everybody and institutionally, thank you to um, MIT for using, allowing for this type of space to be created. You're here. On behalf of MIT, we, we, we thank you uh, for, for being, a, you know, part of the community. And now you're part of MIT too, which is so great. Um, and so one thing that if I, before we go to uh, Megan, um, uh, Brian's entry into the MIT uh, computational law community was um, not through this course, but through one of our close affiliated collaborators, um, which many of us participate in, including Tony and Noah and others. And that is none, none other than Legal Hackers, which you can find out more about at legalhackers.org. And I forgot to mention in the beginning when I was having connection trouble, thank you, Brian, that um, this very event is actually a collaboration um, with Boston Legal Hackers and Delhi Legal Hackers in India. And I wanna just thank and welcome um, all the participants from Delhi Legal Hackers and, and their larger community across India who, who've joined and been such great contributors uh, to, to this workshop. Okay, so with that, um, uh, Megan, uh, you've got the baton. Do you wanna bring us home? Yeah, sure. So thank you everyone again. This was incredible. Um, and uh, I just want to say, don't be shy, contribute, um, submit whatever, you know, comes to your heart. And I think that given, you know, how incredible this group is, that it would be something unheard of and really, really innovative and pioneering in this space. So um, yes, again, don't be shy and contribute. Outstanding. Oh, wait a minute. We, we have one final question here. Do we have time for this? I think we might. Why not? Okay. Um, okay, so uh, this is extra, extra inning at the <laughs> last moment, um, taking as a whole some of the more embryonic and novel topics we discussed. For example, code is law, um, DAO is composable governance. Oh, what's that? Um, wait a minute. Okay, st st everyone st stop, uh, stop chatting for a minute so I can read this. Um, and evaluating all of it through the MIT lens, how do large research groups within MIT factor in the development of these technologies? I'm talking about, for example, MIT Connection Science or researchers under Sandy Pentland. Are the large informal research groups within MIT more like fast followers tracking trends that originally external that originate externally in the crypto governance legal hackers community, or is it the other way around, whereby university research group groups originate most of the ideas which are disseminated onwards or both? What a great question. Um, so it's you know, like you're it's like you're reading my mind because um, I, I think very much about those um, those uh, tracks and how they relate, and there's some balancing there, frankly, to do. Um, and so. Uh, so the answer, the short answer is both. Um, and so there's been any number of examples, which, which I think we're really pleased with, where we've highlighted or spotlighted, I'll say really on point ideas from Sandy Pentland's group and from Connection Science and the Human Dynamics Lab and beyond at MIT, um, like that cool algorithmic um, music um, idea flow we did. And there's um, any number of um, things that we published from MIT. So it's very much um, a way to circulate some of the on-point ideas from across MIT. Uh, the other thing is that we are, the MIT Computational Law Report is literally a research function of MIT, <clears throat> jointly between the MIT Media Lab and Connection Science that you mentioned here. Um, so like on an org chart, that's where it is. But, but it goes the other way around as well. Um, so there's been any number of examples where we've where people have participated and well Brian is a really good example where he kind of came in was a participant who was very external and now he's actually um, a fellow at MIT Connection Science like literally 
um, been incorporated. And we certainly vector ideas in all the time. So it's fairly porous and it goes both ways. And what we hope is there's a synergy that, that, makes, um, that, that makes it better. But part of MIT's mission is, is at, at you know, key times in history when there's a, gonna be like a, a major change in a, in, a, in a sector of the economy or a like, of society when there's tools and technology, MIT, that is, that's changing things, MIT will take a very public spirited view and engage and try to assist with that transition and refactoring um, in, in many different ways. Uh, and so I think some of this is on brand with the mission and the culture at MIT as well. So uh, that would be my, my answer uh, yeah, to that. I, mean, I, I think a good, uh, a good single word to describe it is that it's uh, symbiotic. So, you know, it generates and flows both ways. Um, you know, one example of this would be uh, there was a paper that came out of uh, Sandy's group about uh, possible uh, consortium cryptocurrency kind of stable coin design, um, you know, I think 10 years ago or, or so. And um, that was what Libra used as their kind of basis for <laughs> how to do that. Uh, how to do their cryptocurrency before they kind of encountered some of the uh, uh, practical hurdles um, that they ran into. But, uh, you know, I think I think part of the function of MIT, as Des was saying, was just to bring people together from all of these different spaces and kind of do it in a, in a fun way. So that's been my experience anyway. Yeah, here, here. Um, so, and, and, and fun it has been. So thank you for joining us, everybody, for the kind of extra session and the extra kind of, uh, you know, um, hacking and collaboration um, that, that followed from the composable governance and from the workshop this year. And uh, I especially want to thank all the speakers um, for taking time out of the, your day and for all the prep work uh, that you did this year. Uh, we're, we just couldn't be more grateful. So with that, uh, we're going to adjourn the 2022 MIT Computational Law Workshop. <laughs>